for being facetious or stupid, quite a modest one. Um, um, to try and introduce, because in principle, actually, a lot of this program idea was Laura's. Um, to think through the question of diaspora. So first of all, I want to thank Laura for the idea and for the work that she did in trying to bring this together. Welcome everybody to the Research Center for Material Culture. Um, today we are in Museum Volkerkunde, and for many of you who do not know, the Research Center sits in the middle of four ethnographic museums. Here, Museum Volkerkunde, um, Tropa Museum, Africa Museum, and recently, um, the World Museum in Rotterdam. Now, it is a wonderful space to be in, primarily because what it does is that it offers us the opportunity to try and think with, think through 500,000 objects and almost a million photographs. Now, you must admit that that's an exciting job to have, right? Yes? Oh, Jesus, the room is silent. <laughs> I might be a little more excited than you. <laughs> but it's an Im important work to do, to try and think with things and think about what, what it is that they afford us to, 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 to think about in the world today. More recently, um, our work has been very much focused on questions of the colonial and what to do with colonial objects. We've been involved in a set of conversations both nationally and internationally, in collaboration with numerous partners. Uh, many of the curators who work, work here with us have been trying to think about what are the, what, what, how do we understand these objects differently, what are their afterlives, and how do they connect with the kinds of contemporary discussions around citizenship and belonging in Europe today. We've taken... Um, a few conceptual ideas to think with these objects. One of them is to think not just simply about reparations, but to think through the idea of what it might mean to repair historical wrongs, and how do objects participate in that. Not to think just about restitution, but whether or not it is even possible to restore <coughs> earlier relationships that were constituted through the colonial project. More recently, we've been thinking through the framework of, of care. And what does it mean to care? Because as engines of caring, one could suggest that museums are that. That's what we do very well. We care for things. But as the engines of caring for objects, what might it mean for us to transfer that notion of care to think about the lives of the peoples for, who, for, for, who, for whom these objects are important? So within a framework of critical caring, how might we reorganize our thinking about the museum's role in contemporary society? Diaspora is one of those such words. Diaspora offers us the possibility not just to think um, about motion and mobility, movement, and questions of identity, but it also affords us to locate the, 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 the collections themselves within the contested terrain of questions around citizenship and belonging globally, but also in Europe. So today, we're going to engage in this conversation around the concept of diaspora. We're going to think it through, through the work of many scholars who are here. Thank you for coming from far, some of you, from near. Some scholars like Paul Basu, who is, who is a critical friend of ours, so coming over is quite easy. Thank you, Paul, for this morning's keynote. Um, and we want you to think with us about what it might mean to mobilize this concept. I know Laura has suggested um, some time ago that perhaps we will even try to do a publication from this because it is such an exciting field of thinking that it might afford us something. There are a few ground rules in our um, work. Our ground rules are we, we are not really that formal. So even though I stand up here looking like I'm being formal, we're really not formal. We try, we try to encourage conversation and, and a, a kind of open dialogue. Um, 
if you do not want to be recorded or if you do not want the recording to be used in any way, please let us know so that we can um, um, delete you from the, the, the you. I was in a I was in a workshop last two weeks ago or three weeks ago, um, where we, we where we constituted a deletion bureau, and the deletion bureau were eight people who were deciding on getting rid of twenty percent of museums collections each year. It was a fascinating exercise. I don't think that most museum people will do that, but it was nice anyway. But we will delete you. Normally we should have a, a thing here which says that if you don't want to do it, then tell us. But please tell us. And. Um, and so in the spirit of conversation, then what we want you to do is just put up your hand and ask questions and that kind of thing so we can have it. Um, I won't be back really. I hand over now to Laura and I will be running around and asking myself some critical questions and giving trouble. But welcome to the Research Center for Material Culture. And one of the things I'd like to encourage is that you um, um, join up on our um, mailing list because we have events like this actually too many of them, but almost every week. Welcome. <laughs> and welcome to you, Laura. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Okay. Let's do it like here. I think it works better. Um, my name is Laura Osorio Uregui. I am the event organizer. Um, I am, yeah, so basically this event uh, came because in 2016 I applied for what was then called the Dr. Stephen Engelsman uh, grant, now called the um, Fell uh, Junior Scholar, yeah. Um, so I presented uh, this idea for this conference and it got selected. So um, it has been the work of uh, almost a year to what brings us here today. Um, I'm also currently doing my PhD in uh, the University of Oslo. Um, so this, um, what we will talk about, connects with my own research. Um, so first of all, I would just like to thank um, the Research Center of Material Culture, Wayne Modest. Um, I would like to thank for logistics, Carolyn Nakamura and Nina uh, Ranks Kleikamp. Kleikamp. Yeah. Um, obviously, all of the speakers, thank you for coming from near and far, as um, uh, Wayne put it. Um, there will be a change in the program, which will, I will say immediately. We have had a last minute cancellation. Um, Sandra Dudley was not able to join us today. So that's why you will notice that the whole program has shifted. And um, this will give us some time for a discussion, the final discussion. And if people have questions, it will also give us more time to elaborate on our questions. Um, I would like to thank everyone that is here. So all of the attendants, thank you <coughs> for walking in the really, really cold streets uh, to get here. And also for the people that are uh, live streaming right now, thank you for watching us from the warmth of your home. Um, so, um, um, so basically, I will just uh, give like a little uh, background information. Um, my current PhD works uh, with uh, a community in Colombia, the Wonan community that has been displaced from their normal territory into urban areas. So I am primarily focusing on their craft production, on their baskets, uh, and how they are making baskets, continuing this tradition from the urban area. So um, on the general um, like scope of my research, what I'm dealing is with objects and displacement. So how does displacement affect objects and how do objects affect people that are, have been displaced? Um, so during my own research, I've wanted to address um, also the issues of homemaking. So how also objects in this context of displacement and diaspora or migration are helping, uh, in my case, the Wonan community, to rebuild some type of home in this completely foreign landscape. Um, 
because my work uh, began in the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo, um, and I've worked uh, with several museums uh, in my short time alive, um, so I also wanted to bring forward this uh, part, what happens with these objects when they are collected by museums. How do communities that uh, are source communities for these objects, how do they interact with these objects? And also people that are visiting <coughs> the museum itself. Um, so in a way, this, um, the symposium, what it tries to bring together is the role of the object. So we have these objects that are in migration. Um, how do they help or sometimes uh, make obstacles in museum contexts, um, in a way of how people connect or not with them, uh, and also with the source communities and the communities that are around these objects. Um, so basically, that's the general idea of what we will talk about today. We didn't quite get the name of the source community you were talking about. Ah, uh, Wonan. Wonan. Yeah, in my presentation, I will, it will be written so you can. Okay, so uh, we will go briefly through the program, um, so we all know what is going to happen today. Um, so we will have, well, this introduction, and the whole symposium will be divided into two sections. So the first one will be diasporic objects and museums, um, and the second one, diasporic objects and the construction of home. Um, because of what I mentioned, uh, that we had a cancellation, so it shifted a little bit, uh, the program, but we will maintain the, um, the um, goal of keeping presentations to 30 minutes and 15 minutes that could be extended for questions and if someone wants to begin a small discussion, that can also happen after the, the presentation. Um, we will have a lunch break at from 1 to 2 p.m., a coffee break from 3.30 until 4, and then we will finish with a roundtable discussion that will be led by Wayne Modest. Um, so, this first section uh, of Disparate Objects and Museums, we will have uh, three speakers. First, uh, we will have uh, Professor Paul Basu, uh, which will present a paper or her presentation is titled From Object Diasporas to Museum Affordances. For those of you uh, who are not familiar with his work, um, so Paul Basso is a professor of anthropology at SOAS University of London. Um, he took his PhD at University College London, where he was associated with the Anthropology's Department of uh, Material Culture Group. He went on to teach at the University of Sussex before returning to UCL to run its Museum Studies MA program. His research has focused on the migrations of people, things, ideologies, and narrations of the past. For the past 15 years, he has worked in West Africa, especially in Sierra Leona, and more recently in Nigeria. Uh, he is currently leading a three-year project that is entitled Museum Affordances, uh, which is an attempt to apply an experimental museology to re-engage with colonial collections in decolonial times. Uh, following Professor Paul Basso, we will have Hector Garcia. Um, his presentation is titled Negotiating Place, Meaning and Identity in the Ethnographic Museum of the Central Bank of Colombia. Um, Hector is an anthropologist and holds an MA in social anthropology by the University of Los Andes. Uh, since 2010, he has been a part of the curatorship team of the Gold Museum in Bogota. Um, he has curated uh, a, new, a new exhibition um, in the Ethnographic Museum of the Central Bank of Colombia, which is located in Leticia, so in the Amazon area of Colombia, and uh, an exhibition called Mola's Layers of Wisdom. Um, currently, he's working on a research about the act of repairing objects. His main areas of interest are the history of anthropology in Colombia, practices of representation of the other in museums, and tangible and intangible heritage politics. After uh, Hector finishes, we will have Vonu Weiss, 
Uh, the title of her presentation is Diasporic Waka in a Dutch Museum, Fostering and Medi Mediate Medi Mediating Relationships. Um, <coughs> Bonu Weiss uh, is a creator of Oceania at the National Museum of World Cultures here in the Netherlands, where we are now. Uh, <laughs> she has previously worked at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge and has held a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at, the, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art at the Musée Que Branly in Paris. Um, she curated the Mana Maori exhibition in Leiden and has published a book with the same title. Her fieldwork sites include New Zealand, Tonga, and most recently Arnhem Land in Australia. Her topics of interest and expertise include Pacific art and material culture, museums and cultures of collecting, Pacific musical instruments, Pacific textiles, and the significance of historical objects in a contemporary setting. So these are the three people that will present uh, in the first section. Um, and yeah, so let's have uh, Wayne here. Uh, sorry, Paul. <laughs> sorry. Great, and thanks very much for uh, inviting me along today. Very pleased to, uh, to be here. Um, I'm going to take Wayne's uh, comments. He's already gone, has he? He's already disappeared. Um, can't pin him down for long. Um, to heart, so it's going to be rather informal. So whilst it sounds like I've got a well thought through paper here from Object Diasporas to Museum Affordances, it could be subtitled some random thoughts on museums and diasporas and objects. Um, and I'll mainly be thinking about um, historical ethnographic collections, mostly collected in the colonial era in ethnographic museums um, around the world. Although a lot of my earlier work actually around people diasporas and place and so on was much more about uh, contemporary kind of articulations of this idea of uh, diaspora. Um, so I'll largely be talking to some, some slides um, just give me, is someone going to give me a signal when my time, yes, because I may <coughs> drift off. Um, so in the, in the most literal sense, um, ethnographic uh, museum collections constitute uh, so many diasporas insofar as they've been scattered uh, from their, the places of their origin, as it were. A uh, very literal idea, etymological uh, meaning of diaspora, to scatter. Um, they reside in one place, but their identity is, or seems to be, inextricably linked or associated or grounded in another place. Um, but beyond that very literal understanding of the kind of dispersal of uh, collections, um, my interest really is, as again Wayne was uh, suggesting, is about how this concept, diaspora, which of course is laden with very particular histories and connotations, uh, might constitute a kind of a productive metaphor uh, through which to think both about the, the poetics and the politics of ethnographic collections. Do they exist in a state of exile, longing, as it were, for return? Or are they quite at home in their diasporic uh, locations? How do they exist in and materialize positions between these uh, kind of dichotomized poles of exile and diasporic belonging? So how can, help, uh, how, how can thinking through diaspora help us think through the status, value, and ethics of ethnographic museum collections and address these perennial debates about the relevance uh, of um, ethnographic museums and their collections today in this so-called post-migrant society in which the state of diaspora has become general in a way. Um, we're all seemingly from somewhere else. We all have multiple affiliations, multiple senses of where we belong. So going back to some of the kind of discourse around uh, diaspora, particularly since the 1990s, 
um, Tololian um, in the 1990s uh, you know, mentioned that diasporas represent the exemplary communities of the, of the transnational uh, moment. And following um, that kind of work, uh, there have been various attempts to taxonomize this idea of diaspora. So we have the kind of paradigmatic victim diaspora. Um, we have uh, trade diasporas, imperial diasporas, labor diasporas, and so on and so forth. Um, each expressing a different kind of relation, particularly in terms of the, what motivated the dispersal from that originary place. So the paradigmatic uh, victim diaspora um, is very much about coercion, senses of exile, longing for return. Um, but this also recognized that uh, there's a diversity of motives uh, or, or things that can involve varying degrees of coercion or uh, kind of voluntary uh, migration uh, from places, whether that was to seek a better life elsewhere, economic migration, and so on and so forth. And in many respects, uh, the circumstances around the dispersal of populations um, uh, determines the nature of the diasporic condition in which those uh, communities uh, find themselves in. Although, as we know, that in itself is a gross simplification, and part of what I'd like to do in the first kind of bit of what I'll talk about is to, you know, complicate that notion that if you, your ancestors were forcibly dispersed, that necessarily means you exist in a state of exile and a longing to return to the original homeland. Um, of course, we know that that's, uh, things are a lot more complicated uh, than that. Nevertheless, um, despite recognizing this diversity of causes of population uh, dispersal, um, the connotations and the motifs of the paradigmatic um, kind of uh, uh, diaspora associated with exile and return is, is still very dominant. And um, actually, an earlier research of mine, which was largely based on people of, uh, or who, people who asserted a kind of Scottish uh, diasporic identity, um, what was interesting there is that um, you, you found that there was a desire, as it were, to align their identities, their cultural identities, with a victimological narrative. It's not only the people that migrate and things that migrate but also ideas and discourses and cultural narratives. So in my um, doctoral work, which eventually became this book, Highland Homecomings, um, one of the things I was interested in looking at there was this idea, the articulation of this notion of diaspora, and particularly how um, cultural narratives associated with biblical images of the Jewish diaspora, um, <laughs> with stories of the, um, of the Black Atlantic and so on, were actually appropriated into people's senses of identity, um, even though their ancestors may have uh, been economic migrants in the early 20th century, let's say. Okay. So I was interested in how uh, people came to align themselves with these dominant cultural narratives as a way of narrating a sense of dis-ease of malaise that's actually much more um, uh, harder to narrate by finding these uh, cultural narratives which they could plausibly uh, align their ancestral migrations to. And in the Scottish case, this is very much the narrative of the Highland clearances and what's framed as a kind of conflict between England and Scotland. Although this involves a, uh, a kind of perversion of history, as it were, if we're taking history as some kind of uh, notion of evidentiary kind of fact. These are all very problematic uh, terms, of course. So nevertheless, the point is here is that um, the connotations of different forms of diasporas shift around, um, and quite often it's the victimological narrative of exile and return that comes to be articulated, um, even where it may perhaps not be appropriate. And I'll come back to this um, in, a, in a moment. 
I should say what I'll try and do here is talk a little more generally about this notion of diaspora, unpack this concept a little bit, and then talk about a couple of kind of case examples relating this to material culture and specifically to kind of m m museums and thinking through why this might be a useful term to, to, uh, to consider in relation to museums. So this um, idea of um, exile return is kind of premised on a particular notion of cultural identity, um, which is about uh, a, a kind of essentialized identity, this static kind of isomorphism between the person, an ethnicity, a place, a, a culture, a material culture, a language, as if these things are neatly bounded up together. Uh, and of course, um, how objects migrate with people but still link them back to these places, these essences. So um, we have um, material culture that travels with people. We have also immaterial culture, stories, songs, languages that also move with people. And again, in that Scottish context, these motifs in poetry, in music, uh, in material culture uh, are very apparent. And they're largely an exilic uh, imagination that's being articulated and brought into um, this positioning in the present. This notion of a world made up of bounded, um, essentialized culture zones from which people become exiled is, of course, um, part and parcel of what, particularly in the 19th, early 20th centuries, the project of anthropology uh, in many respects constructed. And um, so we're, we're in the context of ethnographic collections assembled in those periods. A lot of the time it was precisely to construct this notion of bounded identities um, that we're trying so hard ever since in a way to kind of undo and unshackle ourselves from this notion. Um, and in many respects, um, by critically thinking through this notion of diaspora, which um, runs contrary to a lot of um, cultural politics because there's, of course, particularly in those contexts where people's ancestors were coerced into migrating or being taken elsewhere, the investment in that notion, in that sense of identity, is paramount. So it's a problematic criticism as well. Um, because, of course, one has to be mindful of the, the politics involved in, in, in all of this. However, if we think in a broader sense about the human condition, of course, the history of humanity is a history of movement and migration. Um, so whether we're talking in deep pasts in terms of the dispersal of human being uh, around the world, um, or, of course, in terms of much more recent um, human uh, movement. So there's a diversity of um, forms of uh, coercion or voluntarism that led to this dispersal of people. We can't level all of that and say, well, we're living in a... Um, this transnational world um, that um, all migrations are somehow equal. Uh, of course, there are histories um, which shape them in very different ways, and we need to be mindful of this. Um, and um, whilst there's this uh, rhetoric of uh, cosmopolitanism and mobility and um, being at home in these diasporic contexts, of course, as Stuart Hall reminds us, uh, we need to think very much about how these, uh, the understanding of these different diasporic formations that were inflected by these particular histories. Um, and um, Stuart Hall's kind of d discussion of diaspora I still find very inspirational, even though we're talking of a piece of work now nearly 30, uh, 30 years ago, of course. Um, I think a key point here is that even within those so-called victim diaspora contexts, this notion of the essentialized identity is, as he put it, very much a positioning. Okay? These are strategic, not always self-consciously strategic, but nevertheless, they do some work, as it were, um, these particular identifications with particular other places. But as Stuart Hall reminds us in this uh, quote, um, we're wrong to, um, to, to, to place, um, to regard as this idea of truth, as it were, being buried, the true identity of self buried somehow within oneself and linking uh, to these other 
places. Uh, and he, he articulates this here in terms of cultural identity is not only a matter of being, that sense of an essential identity, but also of becoming. And I think this is a very powerful notion, this notion that um, our identities are shaped very much in the present um, and in the future, as it were, on this kind of trajectory. And the particular articulations of these histories um, are part of our positioning, uh, the politics of what we're wanting to uh, do with our own uh, identities, as it were, in the, in, in, in the present. The past, he writes, continues to speak to us, but no longer addresses, sorry, but it no longer addresses us as a simple factual past, since our relation to it, like the child's relation to the mother, is always already after the break. It is always constructed through memory, fantasy, narrative, and myth. Cultural identities are the points of identification, the unstable, unstable points of identification or sutra, which are made within the discourses of history and culture, not an essence, but a positioning. Um, <clears throat> and of course, thinking through this in relation to museum collections, historical museum collections, um, these two resources which are used in this positioning process. These are the resources which people, along with other kinds of um, narratives, etc., can be articulated in this project of positioning. Um, I also always am drawn to James Clifford's uh, kind of comment here. Diaspora cultures mediate in a lived tension the experience of separation and entanglement of living here and remembering, desiring another place. That sense of in-betweenness um, which um, is, I think, profoundly tied up with the diasporic condition, which, as I mentioned earlier, in some senses has become a general um, condition. Um, nevertheless, we have this idea of a dichotomy between the roots uh, kind of, and the routes, or roots, uh, being and becoming, different uh, positionalities in this, uh, in this kind of uh, cultural field. Um, and um, it's interesting to think how this then t kind of can be mapped on to thinking of material culture and thinking of museum collections in, in, in ethnographic museums in particular. We tend to associate um, ethnographic collections with this kind of idea of roots in some respects. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, th by definition, they've come from elsewhere. They're residing in these diasporic condition, uh, in these diasporic locations, and yet part of the work that they're put to is always linking back to that other place that are articulated within that kind of a way. So they themselves are kind of, uh, we're, we're celebrating their rootedness. But in many respects, that also is a kind of a, a problematic because part of that sense these are exiled objects is this notion of return, of course. So discourses of repatriation become very easily articulated. If, however, we think of m along Stuart Hall's kind of line of becoming and the roots of diaspora, um, where actually um, they don't, they're not separate from that originary place, but somehow also at home and in a creative space of diaspora, a positive creative space of diaspora, um, it complicates that, s that straightforward notion of you know, where do these things belong. And, of course, they belong somewhere in between these these poles. So <clears throat> to think straightforwardly, we can take an example of where there's some kind of unequivocal kind of coercive dispersal of objects and the always turn to uh, the Benin uh, treasures, as it were, as, 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 a, as, a, as an example, simply partly because they're so um, powerfully expressed in these kind of contemporary photographs and so on. Uh, collections that have been dispersed, particularly around Europe and North America, through um, uh, through, through the Benin uh, punitive expedition of 1897. Uh, so we might see this as the kind of the, kind of the classic uh, victim object diaspora, uh, objects that are in exile that have been uh, uh, forcibly removed um, and which long uh, to return in some senses, and hence the politics around that. I'd like to just contrast that um, with um, another case, and I'll be talking a little bit more about um, this person here. This is Northcote Thomas, who was the first um, government anthropologist in Britain, but appointed by the colonial office 
in the early 20th century to conduct a series of ethnographic surveys in, in uh, southern Nigeria and Sierra Leone. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to him, but um, what's interesting here is he, in the course of these um, surveys, he collected a huge amount of material, also took many photographs, sound recordings, and so on and so forth, but some really impressive uh, collections. And what's unusual is that we have just the trace of his collecting practice evident in some of the correspondence that I've managed to to dig out, and this is actually quite unusual um, to find some of this, um, because what we find in his correspondence, and these are letters um, to, um, to uh, colleagues in the British Museum, to um, uh, Joyce and uh, Reed. Reed was the kind of effectively the, uh, the keeper of ethnography at that time. Joyce was his kind of second in command. Is he's talking specifically about how he's purchasing these objects. So he's writing to Joyce here in 1909 from from Nigeria, I'm sending, and, and, and by the way, Thomas was working in Benin City, what, 10 years after the punitive expedition, so in the interregnum uh, when the Oba was still uh, exiled in, in Calabar. So it's, 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 it's close on the heels of that other uh, collecting um, moment. I'm sending off collections shortly, about 200 objects, some rather dear, but prices are up in BC, in Benin City. Tell Balfour, uh, I'm sending him an iron lamp. I will buy him a brass one if he likes. They cost 12 and 6 to 15 shillings. New, old ones correspondingly dearer. So in contrast to this notion of colonial loot, objects taken by force, what we see here is Thomas, the anthropologist, um, buying stuff at the market, a market that's determined by local sellers, you are setting the prices, uh, these kind of things, particularly the old stuff is uh, expensive. You can commission the new stuff. So it's, it's a very different narrative than we're used to hearing about the acquisition of things at this time in somewhere like Benin City. Um, we find that, uh, that, that kind of the industry uh, for these things is, 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 is uh, buoyant, uh, that there's um, a vibrant market in the selling of these, uh, these objects. Here's, here's uh, another letter to, to read. I've sent off during this last month some 1,300 objects. I've just got some wonderful secret society dresses, four in all. I've ordered all the jujus in Benin City to be carved, probable cost £25. I go from here to uh, Sabongida, Abedi, Ida, etc., and can easily buy another 2,000 to 3,000 if you can find the money. If you cannot, I fear Berlin or the Yankees must have them. So, <clears throat> this again, this notion that Thomas, the anthropologist, is commissioning uh, these ethnographic objects, these authentic objects, which uh, will then be sent to somewhere like the, the British Museum. And, of course, we see the kind of competition that's going on. The, uh, the, the ethnographic museums in the States, in, uh, in, in Berlin, uh, who, uh, who will have them if Thomas isn't there collecting them for Britain in this case. Okay. Interestingly, the British Museum didn't want any of this stuff, actually. You know. um, Thomas uh, made the mistake of thinking that uh, he had a big budget from the BM to be spending on all of this. Reed reminded him that he'd, uh, you know, his budget of £50, which they discussed, was actually his whole collecting budget for a year. And why did he think that he alone should be you know, spending this for him on this one expedition? Reed didn't like this idea that these things were bought on the market or that he was commissioning these things to be, to be made. Things that we'd now say, this is our ethical collecting practice these days. We find local craftspeople and so on. We commission these things for our museums. Um, at that time, clearly this notion of authenticity, that the object shouldn't be something that suddenly you've just paid to be made, um, was not seen as part of this. So we're seeing a different kind of story here. However, before we get carried away to think that uh, Thomas was a new man, as it were, not uh, involved in these kind of colonial power relations and so on, he goes on in this same letter to read, I'm fit as a fiddle and cover a dozen miles with my gun most days, shoot, or, 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 hunting and so on. That was how I unearthed the dance dresses. They were in a bush house. I only got them by drawing up my force of police, one in number, and threatening some 50 chiefs, etc., that I would take them by force if they did not agree to sell. So, that complicates things, of course. 
So on the one hand, he's purchasing things, he's not stealing them, these are not colonial loot, but there we go. This is within a broader context of colonial power relations, uh, including the threat of violence, apparently. Um, people are being forced to sell in certain context. So I don't want to paint our man Thomas as some uh, kind of hero either. It's all about ambiguity then. And, uh, you know, that places us back in that middle zone, in the in-betweenness, uh, which was uh, the theme of this book. If Sandra had been there uh, here this morning, she, she contributed a chapter, an interesting chapter, uh, which relates, I think, to perhaps what she might have been saying here in this book as well. And how this diasporic place of in-betweenness uh, is also manifest in the material flows in the colonial era. And uh, what I especially liked about this Sierra Leonean um, Sunday Society mask that's on the front cover of this book is this spirit, you know, after all, this is a spirit who's ador adorned with this European-style hat. Um, and we can see how uh, the hat, as it were, made this migration to uh, West Africa and became a symbol of authority and so on in local um, power structures, but also cosmologies in terms of the spirit world and so on. Um, at the same time as something like this mask moved in the opposite direction to Europe, initially for display um, in, the, um, in the colonial and Indian uh, exhibition of 1886. Ironically, it was, it, was, you know, it was articulated as this kind of, you know, epitomizing the kind of um, the, 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 um, the otherness of, of, of at West Africa's kind of um, spirit worlds and so on. Uh, and yet there it has that Western hat. <clears throat> so in betweenness as a kind of key, key, key thing to take from this notion of diaspora. Um, to draw, to kind of shift, as it were, discourses and to think more about migration studies and, um, oh gosh, right, okay, really? <laughs> I see, you didn't, you reset the time, I looked at my, anyway, uh, okay, I better, better speed on. Um, the value of diasporas to homeland, okay, we've spoken about that idea of uh, exile and return. One of the kind of key metaphors that I've been interested to ex explore is this idea of diasporic remittances. So within um, uh, um, development studies, for instance, one of the key ways in which diasporas are invoked is through their value, their economic value to places of origin. Uh, which uh, the money that's sent back through family networks and so on far outweighs uh, a lot of uh, development budgets and so on, aid development budgets. So there's a, there's a, a keenness to open up what are so-called uh, remittance corridors to ease those economic flows. Um, and um, this is a, a metaphor that I've kind of worked with in uh, my work in Sierra Leone, for instance, to think of the diaspora of Sierra, Leone, Sierra Leonean objects that have been dispersed from, 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 from Sierra Leone uh, and now reside in Europe and North America, and how we can think of the value of those objects in their diasporic locations for Sierra Leone, and to think through this idea of what symbolic value do they send back, and how, as museums, can we open up corridors, these remittance corridors, so that these values can uh, return. And um, had I more time, I would um, tell you a little bit more about this project, um, which was all about uh, digitization on the one hand, but also about thinking through this idea of how value could return by virtue of these diasporic relations. How can value return along those same corridors, as it were, that these objects have migrated through to find themselves in these, these ethnographic museums? So through various kind of co collaborations, um, working, uh, exchange, the return of um, uh, information about objects to places where they were, f they were found, the return of histories, exchanges with teachers, curatorial exchanges, exhibitionary exchanges, um, celebrations. This is in the, uh, the British Museum. Uh, the first time, I think, um, Sierra Leone has really been celebrated within the British Museum in any significant way. And an event here, that same Sunday Society mask, uh, performing in the Grand Court, very much um, about the confluence of an object diaspora and a human diaspora. This was organized by Sierra Leoneans in London, after all. 
So <clears throat> very, very, very briefly, in conclusion, I just want to um, mention this uh, project museum affordances, which was going to be the second half of my talk, had I not rambled on too much. Um, uh, and um, a, an experiment, really, with this idea of um, the multiple investments in these historical ethnographic collections. Uh, not only the source communities, as we are all familiar with, but also how do these intersect with diasporic communities? And this is something we're trying very much to think about in this project, re-entanglements. Re um, and so that's w this is working with those collections uh, from Northcote Thomas that I mentioned earlier. And um, part of this is about mapping those collections. They're all dispersed in different institutions. Um, they've become divorced from each other. Sound has become divorced from image, has become divorced from object. Uh, has, uh, and they've, in many respects, become divorced from these places that they were collected. Um, so part of it's about doing that kind of um, you know, real collections-based work. It's also about taking this material back. You know, what does it represent to communities uh, the return of these diasporic <coughs> objects, Im images and sounds to those same communities from which they were collected. So again, this kind of uh, uh, photo uh, elicitation and, um, and the return of copies of this kind of material. However, and I'll just touch on this in conclusion, um, it's very much also about trying to engage with Sierra Leonean and Nigerian communities in these diasporic kind of positions. And I wanted to throw out another idea there about the digital diaspora, because this is a space, to, going back to um, Stuart Hall, uh, and these resources which diasporic communities are drawing upon to shape their cultural identities and their narratives, um, how the digital is very important in, the, in this, in many respects, because this is the repository, this is the place uh, where a lot of our collections and images end up being most accessible. Um, and these are curated and debated in lots of interesting ways through on Facebook and so on and so forth. And um, indeed, many of Northcote Thomas's photographs in particular have found their way through one way or another onto the internet. Actually, a very small percentage of those um, that, uh, that are existing, which we're now trying to make more accessible, but nevertheless, it's interesting how they're there through digitized copies of books and so on and so forth. And I want to just read you this little um, quote from uh, a woman that got in contact with me who wanted to see if she could get a copy of this, a, a high-quality digital copy of this so that she could print it out and put it on her wall because she'd, she'd got it off the internet, but of course it was just some pixelated little kind of thing. So I just, just want to read you this because I think this really articulates something of the power uh, of these. The, the, the image, this image, has possessed me since I first saw it, and I would greatly appreciate your help in being able to behold it every day in high definition. I'm a young Igbo woman raised in the United States, trying to weave together an image of pre-colonial Igbo life through early ethnographies and whatever of the rapidly fading intergenerational stories I can preserve. My brother, another stereotypical third culture kid, found a PDF of Northcote's book online a couple of years back, and the rest is history. Every time I look at that photo, I feel like I am in that square, behind the middle mask. I hope to open museums in Nigeria dedicated to Igbo history and culture, revive old community celebrations, and create programming and curriculum and all things Igbo and West African over time. I moved to Nigeria three months ago to get started, and you may be holding the finish line ribbon to step one. Get those spirits on the gallery wall in my living room. We all have to start somewhere. And I think this, this really is um, a, 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 an everyday commonplace statement in many respects. It articulates so many people's desires to ground themselves, to find home, even though they're actually very much at home in this mobile space. And that notion of how people can be transported through images, but also ethnographic objects and so on, and imagine themselves back in that originary space, that profound space of identity, um, I think is key. And um, <clears throat> uh, these are other examples of trying to activate these kinds of collections uh, with diasporic artists, with others. 
Um, I think the key thing is to come back to this notion of, of affordance, which I haven't really mentioned at all, but just to say that this is the, um, the potential, the, the, the latent possibilities that reside in our collections and our ethnographic images and so on is immense. And it comes back to the role of the museum then within that and our responsibility, our ethical responsibility, to find ways of activating this material, okay? Some, by chance, people come across these things, but in a way that's not good enough. I think our responsibility is to come up with the, the ways, the methods, of actually demonstrating what this material can do. And the problems that raises, which I think I'll just leave you with, because of course, we're trying to undo that sedentary image of the world where people's identities are only rooted in place and where there's these senses of exile if one suddenly, you know, find oneself separate from that place. And, and so there's a problematics to that. Do we want to perpetuate that kind of rooted identity, the double OT version, or how can we both activate this material but ensure, as it were, that it doesn't provide a negative space, as it were, but it's a positive space. You know, is that our job too? Okay. Are we arbiters as museums and so on of how they're used? How can we ensure that it's a complicated story that's, um, that, 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 that's kind of appropriated, um, that's, 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 a, that's a productive, creative thing, rather than uh, you know, this idea of an identity that we're... Trying to trying to undo. <laughs> Sorry, that was rather rushed and rambled. Uh, so, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm very thankful to be here. I'm very honored uh, to be amongst uh, these colleagues. And I want to thank Laura for the invitation and to the Research Center for Material Culture for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Hector Garcia Botero. I am from Colombia. I'm working uh, at the Gold Museum of, Go of Bogota since 2011. And I'm going to talk about the Ethnographic Museum of the Central Bank of Colombia, uh, which is in Leticia, in the Amazon. Um, so Leticia is located in what we know as the Amazonia Basin, uh, which is roughly this green area we see in this map. And um, it is, of course, uh, with uh, the, the, the home of the Amazon River, which is like the longest in the world, and it goes through 6,000 kilometers all over from Peru to the Atlantic Ocean. It is what we call a world of waters. So if you ever go to the Amazon, just prepare to see water in different shapes and colors and uh, sizes, and it is a wonderful place to be. And Leticia is uh, right here. Uh, it is one of the um, most important cities of Colombia because it is its southernmost uh, city. And it has approximately 33,000 inhabitants and it is located on the bank of the Amazon River. And it, also it is also located in a place where, it meets, where, where Colombia meets Peru and Brazil. So in a place we call the Triple Frontier or Tres Fronteras. So the three countries meet uh, right there. Um, the collection of the Ethnographic Museum, which is the object of my presentation, was formed between the 1960s and 1980s by Father Antonio Jover Lamagna. Antonio Jover Lamagna was a Capuchin friar um, from the Order Friars Minor Capuchin, and he was born in Barcelona and in Spain in 1924. 
and he died in Leticia in 2008, in Leticia, in Colombia. He established several missionary centers in the Amazon region. Some of them were along the Amazon River. Uh, one in Leticia. Um, the headquarters of his service, and the other ones in Nazareth and Puerto Nariño. Some settlements mainly formed by Ticuna people, one of the ethnic indigenous groups that lives in the Amazon. Uh, he also have had uh, missionary centers along the Putumayo River, uh, in Tarapacá, La Chorrera, and San Rafael. And he also had uh, settlements around the Caqueta River Basin in La Pedrera, Miriti, and Araraquara. This Uh, where he had the missionary centers. A large part of the collection uh, actually comes from these settlements or from settlements near around uh, these missionary centers. The collection is formed by approximately 350 objects. Um, they are ident identified in different manner as belonging to different Amazonian ethnic groups uh, such as Muru y Muinane, Bora, Yukuna, Tanimuka, Makuna, Tikuna, or Witot. Uh, I know that sounds like name, drop naming, but uh, it is a testimony to the diversity of the Amazonian region, and that's just in Colombia. Uh, in Brazil or Peru, you would find several others, and that's just cultural. When you go to linguistics, it's even bigger. You can see their baskets, ceremonial attires, stools, um, and hunting and fishing tools that form the collection. So uh, 30 years ago, in 1988, Father Jover and the Central Bank of Colombia agreed on the loan of this collection for the next 20 years. That is, between the period of 1988 and 2008. And the agreement had only two conditions. The collection needed to stay in Leticia, and it shouldn't be disseminated. That was the only two conditions. That, that, those were the only two conditions. And it was presented as a museum, and it was called the Museum of the Amazon Man. And it had also the name of Father Lamagna um, at its door. It had some information about the objects, and it was complemented by some texts and information that were outside the room of the collection. After these 20 years, the parts, Father Jover and the Central Bank, left the opportunity to the bank to consider the definitive donation of the collection. Having seen the conservation of the collection and its exhibition, and perhaps knowing about his own age, Father Jover agreed to make the donation. You have to remember that the donation was finally made in 2008, the same year that Father Jover dies. The bank accepted the donation, and it, it is today the largest of its kind to its own collections. This is how the museum looked back uh, in this first exhibition. These are some of the objects showed in the room back then. And since 2011, a cultural team of which I was part of began to work in the new exhibition and in the new activities of the museum. And finally, in 2015, the museum opened renewed. And it looks like this nowadays. I want to address in this conference some of the biographies of the objects and what did these biographies meant to the practices of collectionism and exhibition of the objects in Leticia. At the end of my conference, I would like to share some aspects of the renovation process and what is happening today to these objects, to the museum, and to the history of travel, displacement, and the diasporic condition of the collection. So one, one of the greatest worries I had when I began to work in the project of renovation of the Leticia Museum was the legitimacy of the possession of these objects. I entered the museum staff, the gold museum staff, in December 2010, and I was assigned to the project in January 2011. So just at the beginning of my career at the gold, at the gold museum, I didn't have information about the collection, or for that matter, about the museum. I first traveled to Leticia around March 2011 after spending a lot of time trying to catch up with some of the anthropological literature of the region, and especially of the Colombian sector of the Amazon. But the goal of these visits, and of, of the first visits I, I made to Leticia, was from my own point of view, very, very simple. 
I wanted to grasp the connection of these objects to the so-called source communities and their feelings about their place in the Banks Museum. So the first thing that stood out was a certain feeling of gratitude to the institution for the keeping and preserving of, and preserving of the objects. And this was very strange to me. I am most used to read about claiming for repatriation from all over the world. And even in Colombia itself, it is a very familiar discourse, especially for archaeological collections that are outside the country. So my surprise was even bigger when I understood that it was not only gratitude towards the museum, but also towards Father Jover's enterprise of collectionism. How come this collection didn't arise anger against colonizers? against, for instance, the religious missions or the central authorities of the nation? Why property of these objects was not very firmly disputed, but rather loosely accepted and seen as a fair thing? And this was my first reaction also because, especially Capuchins, the order uh, of Father Jover, has a history of cruel treatment of indigenous population in Colombia. And it was denounced several years ago also by anthropologists. And this image and this text shows this kind of relationship he established with some of the indigenous people I was talking back then. This is an in memoriam speech that Anastasia Candreja Macuri, a Witoto leader, uh, a person who was very close to the museum, made in honor of Father Jover. And she calls him Sabio Kururu, which roughly translates uh, Kururu Wise Man. And it's very funny because kururu is not even an Amazonian, a Colombian Amazonic word, but it's rather uh, from Paraguay, from the Guarani area. But that's the way he called himself. Father Jover called himself wise man kururu. And he identified himself, and evidently Anastasia did as well, indigenous fisherman of the Amazon. So he was like trying to approach an I can't assure you it was very successful, but he tried to approach communities in a very horizontal way. And I think that marked a lot the relationship between these communities and Father Jover's uh, job. He, he, he had become a close reference to elders and jokesters from different ethnic backgrounds. People who had met him at the beginning of his missionary work and met him until his final days were, in fact, People I was meeting then, when I began at the museum, as valid interlocutor to the interests of the museum. As you notice, I didn't meet Father Jover, so it is impossible for me to make some kind of semblance of his character in Leticia. But I can tell you this, he was able to keep the indigenous people to his mission and to his work, and that included naturally his collection. They were very, very close. So the feeling of gratitude to this collection and its place or at least the absence of feeling of anger or resentment is in part due to the practices and relationships of Father Jover with some of these individuals. But beyond Father Jover's own personal qualities, I think we can understand this feeling if we discover the, di the diasporic condition of the objects before being collected and after that. For that, it is important to frame this collection between two episodes of Amazon history in the 20th century the rubber bomb of the first decades, and the establishment of Leticia as a Colombian city in the 1930s. This is Anastasia uh, Candre. Usually identified with Julio Cesar Arana's empire, the extraction of rubber of the Amazon forest is one of the greatest tragedies of the century, and one that in many aspects illuminates the link between mass production of death and of goods in capitalism. Displacement from traditional territories is a mark for a huge part of the indigenous population that was born in the Amazon during the 1950s. Either their parents or the parents of their parents had to move, to escape, and even to forget their language, their customs, and their celebrations in order to survive. These are drawings denouncing uh, the actions of Julio Cesar Arana's enterprise in the Amazon. And you can see him standing uh, on uh, graves and skeletons and his own uh, fortune right in the safety box. And here they are denouncing the tortures and the mistreatments of indigenous people uh, that were uh, collecting uh, rubber. 
So what Father Jover encountered in the second half of the century were not isolated communities, but rather communities trying to regroup, trying to reinvent themselves, to find new histories of origin, and to forget and to cure the, the memories of the time of rubber. This is a process that is still going on, and perhaps we can, talk it, we can talk about it at some point later in the conference. But this means, at least from a historical point of view, that the objects collected by Father Jover were being made essentially in the context of resistance, but not vaguely resistance to civilization or evangel evangelization, but to physical and biological and cultural annihilation. The fact that Father Jover was collecting these objects was not a sign necessarily of dispossession, but it could have meant a way to survive and to send a message to the future. In that light, we know for a fact that these objects were collected not from a pristine source, but rather from sources in movement, communities trying to reestablish themselves in the forest once again. There is not a great sense of turning up objects from their original from their original homes because that home was already lost in this massive tragedy. The displacement of where should we locate the origin of the objects is very significant. But it is only relevant if we understand the nature of the destination of the objects, that is, the city of Leticia. And although we think today of Leticia as a Colombian city, it was a Peruvian port right until 1922 and it had some relevance of the commerce, for the commerce along the Putumayo and the Amazon rivers. But after that date, after 1922, it became officially Colombian. And nonetheless, in 1932, some Peruvian citizens decided to take back Leticia and instigated an international con conflict between these two countries. The war ended a year later, and in 1934, the Colombian state decided to increase its presence in Leticia. To fund the war, some people even donated archaeological gold objects. Some of these kinds, you can find it in the Gold Museum, where I work, but also in the National Museum. And that very same year, in 1934, after the war ended, the Central Bank opened its office in the city, in Leticia. And during the 1940s and 1950s, some years right before Father Jover arrived to Leticia, the population of the city had increased notably. On one side, indigenous population was migrating to the new city. For some of them, Colombia was the opposite of the robber and the robber's extractors. They were often called just Peruvians. So to go to Colombia meant a way to not be in Peru. And on the other side, peace and population coming from the Andes, from the interior of the country, were going to this new land of opportunity, not only following the official propaganda about the city, but, out, but following their own history and spirit, spirit of colonizers of the forest. When the Order Friars Minor Capuchin assumed the apostolic prefecture of Leticia, that is like the chief Catholic uh, office in, in the city, in 1952, indigenous settlements were forming around Leticia, up the rivers, but also right out, outside the city, in what we call today the kilometers. And this is the denomination we have to the settlements that are located along a dead end road that goes right into the forest and disappears completely. So just imagine you have this road and you go there and suddenly it's the forest and you can't go any further. <laughs> and it sounds strange, but <laughs> it is like that. And so the, some of these settlements are resguardos, special territories for indigenous communities. And even one object of the collection is listed as coming from one of these settlements. So you see it right there place, kilometer 11, in the road, Leticia Tarapaca. And this is the object, uh, what we call a yadiku, uh, object of percussion uh, that you put on, on the ground. So, in a sense, against what is very common in practices of collectionism, these objects were not going to some external place of observation and analysis. They were going to their future home, as many other persons, indigenous or not, were doing at the same time. Of course, these were not equal displacements. Peasants and public officers were going to a new land, a new paradise offered by the official propaganda. Missionaries, such as Father Jover, were trying to reinvigorate their work after the Second Vatican Council. And for a great number of indigenous people, it was a migration to a new opportunity, once again, to live in the forest. 
So I, th I think that these are the reasons why, didn't, what I, why I didn't encounter resentment or anger against the collectionism of Father Jover. The objects are for the generation of indigenous people living and growing up in Leticia in their home, a home made of displacements, travels, and <coughs> histories that are parallel to their own. But that, just, that, that is just part of the story. We have to relocate the location, the, the collection, in the Central Bank Museum. Because although you may say that Father Jover's collectionism was uh, okay for the indigenous population, uh, you can also may think that the, trans the mobilization of the collection from Father Jover's house to the Central Bank uh, could have meant uh, could have felt like some kind of aggravation to the people. So under what conditions may we understand the relationship between this collection and the bank's museum? And I think that the first aspect of this relationship that has to be highlighted is that with the objects exhibited at the bank and managed by that institution, it became a public collection. They were no longer limited to some people interested and close to Father Jover. Now they were open to everybody in Leticia. And in fact, the land in which the cultural center of Leticia was built was a public gift that the Council of Leticia gave to the bank to celebrate its, fi its 50 years of service of the institution to the capital of the Amazon. But once again, one could wonder why this public office is still highly appreciated. Colombia is, and it has been for a long time, a place where citizens distrust its public offices. Uh, we are convinced that corruption is everywhere and that people elected to some position, positions are cheating on us. Uh, and you especially would like to mistrust institutions managing all the money. <laughs> but curiously, the public perception of the bank is the exact opposite. And I am not trying to sell you a good image of my employer, uh, although it, it, it is okay for me to do that. But I, I want to talk about the perception of the institution, the, the public perception of the institution. For the past decade, it has been consistently ranked as the most or the second most trusted institution in the country. And, it is, and this is in spite of the fact that the central bank is a very cryptic institution. Uh, it manages a very technical language, and in your daily life you can't understand uh, very um, clearly what uh, they are doing. But I think that this paradox of being trusted at the same time that is a very cryptic institution has a very straightforward solution. They have done for a, lot, for, for a long time a kind of soft internal diplomacy, relying on their cultural activity. And this cultural activity has not been only done in the most important cities of the country, such as Bogota, Barranquilla, or Medellin, but also and especially in the more historically relegated ones, like Florencia, Buenaventura, or Leticia. So that means that in some cities, and for some of the citizens of the country, the cultural activity of the bank is the only stable, reliable, high quality cultural presence of the country. So, this is what I mean when I, th when I think about this kind of soft internal diplomacy. So if we consider that the placing of the collection in Leticia was part of a travel in search for, of a home, the opening, the, the opening of the museum ratified the city as the proper home of the collection. The museum ha was always considered a museum of the material culture of the people living in and around Leticia, and had always had indigenous guides, researchers, and young students and even kids going back to the collection. For those 20 years, between 1988, when the museum opened, until 2008, when the collection was received, the museum became the proper home of the collection. Not only the place where the objects were, but the place where the objects could be useful. This double framing of the collection, first as objects made in a historical and cultural context of forced displacement, and second, as coming to a new city and finding a place in a new museum allows us, finally, to reflect on some aspects of the renovation process. These are some images of some indigenous leaders and intellectuals who I met when I was working on the renovation 
of the museum. So the first aspect nominated, as I, was, as, as I said in these meetings, was this sentiment of gratitude towards the collection and the museum, expressed very clearly by leaders like Hitoma Safaima. And the second aspect that became very clear was that, the, that's the, was that of the museum as instrumental of political and cultural process of the communities around Leticia, as Ruth Lorenzo told me once. I had at the beginning of the project a very firm intention to not reify cultural identity, ethnic boundaries, as if they were communities separated between them and in opposition to the history of the rest of the country. The historical perspective of my own curatorship helped to solve some of these issues. But when I presented the idea for the ethnographic exhibition, it was firmly opposed. And I thought there were going to be opposition, but I didn't expect it expected to come from the indigenous leaders. My surprise is still relevant today. I thought, and I still think, that the museum should show through the objects this history of displacements, of travels, and of communication. But if you see the ethnographic exhibition today and compare it to how it was before, and you have in the upper side of the slide the before and in the downside the today exhibition, you would see the same ethnic frontiers are still present and are even more obvious to the visitors. And this was a petition exclusively made by these leaders and intellectuals. They didn't want to cause any sense of confusion of who they were, how they are differenti differentiated from each other, or how they don't share the same history. Through my conversations with them, I asked insistently, aren't these objects shared by all of you? For instance, the material culture used to prepare, to keep, and to share mambi, made of the coca leaves, is not common to several groups in the Amazon? Or the use of yanchama, a natural fiber, isn't it shared by different groups to make different objects? And of course, I know and I understand there are cultural markers that are very important, and they were going to be present in the museum, but they were not enough for them. They were confusing to their own point of view. And today, when I see the museum, I understand that it was not a problem of some ethnographic or cultural um, accuracy. It was politically and educationally irrelevant. The museum is the home of a very complex history. And to indigenous people, and even as for tourists and foreigners, and foreigners that go there to see a very neutral space, for the indigenous users of the collection, the guides, the people that interact in this space, they understood that it had to be very clear about the existing, the surviving, and the, of the ethnic groups that are representing through the objects. So this perspective of blurring ident identities, which is very appreciated from, for some anthropological trends, was rapidly discarded from these conversations. I would like to end with some remarks about the limitations of the museum and how the diasporic condition of the objects is flourishing after the museum opened. And I want to insist in, in this. What is happening today, it is only possible after the museum opened. When the museum was closed, or even before the renovation, it didn't spark this kind of conversation and of activism um, around the museum. I don't want to make you think that the museum is a community-guided museum. It was designed, and it is still is, an institutional museum, and in that logic, it represents the history and culture of the Amazon from what I would like to call an hegemonic point of view. This point of view is very strong and is persistently trying to reduce the diasporic condition of the objects, presenting them as objects without history and belonging to Colombia, the country in general, in first place, and then to other people, indigenous people that are exotic Colombians. Of course, the process of renovating the museum in constant conversation with these indigenous leaders and intellectuals made the museum a little less aggressive as a space and as an exhibition. And the contributions of these interactions were very important to the museum. And they did especially left a mark on how we think of this museum nowadays. And not only this museum, not only the ethnographic museum. As I said at the beginning, I work for the Gold Museum. And the Gold Museum is like 
the principal museum of the archaeological museums of the Central Bank of Colombia. And after, after the museum in Leticia opened, the Gold Museum has opened two renovated museums, one in Santa Marta and the other one in Pasto, and is working on a third one in Cartagena. And er in every museum, in spite of not being ethnographic, the problem of the quest and the question of how the communities around the museum relate to the collection is being addressed even in a stronger way than it was in Leticia. My curator colleagues are spending more time with their colleagues in these citizens, and they are traveling to meet the different leaders, artisans, and communities around those museums. And I, and I know this sounds like what every museum has been doing for the last 30 years, but it wasn't the case to the Gold Museum. This museum is highly closed, very expert-oriented, and in the way it presents the collection and in the way the information interacts with the visitors. But I think, and I want to argue this, the experience of Leticia opened the mind of directors, architects, and archaeologists to explore, to keep close, and to understand the needs, the meanings of these objects, no matter if they are archaeological or ethnographical in the process of doing a museum. So coming back to Leticia, and after 2015, we began to work with a former colleague, uh, Salima Cure, in a project to explore the meanings and uses of material culture in the collection with more indigenous leaders and researchers. And here we can see uh, one of them, who is Abel Santos, a Ticuna indigenous leader. And what we wanted to do was to open the native perspectives of the collection with the economic and institutional support of the museum. As we do with different researchers, from anthropologists to biologists, we hired them as independent researchers to use the collection to look for some meanings in it. We called different people living in Leticia or around Leticia to come to the museum to talk about the perspectives of this research. And we hired two persons for each group represented in the museum, the Tikuna, the Jikuna, and the Witos. And they went to the museum, they talked to me and Salim about their plans, and they did some research with their communities, with their parents and their grandparents, their neighbors, and even with their non-indigenous friends. And this process reactivated the value of the collection as memory of the past, as a memory of what is no longer done in the daily life of indigenous people. And this reinforces uh, the first thing we saw some years ago when we began. But here's when change uh, comes in. These new researchers are finding out that some of these objects should be closer to the people. And some of them should be even forbidden in the museum. So exploring the meanings and uses that other indigenous people have of the collection, they began to realize the political conflicts of collectionism, conflicts that were not in our mind when we were consulting and exploring the renovation of the museum at the first time. And I think that this is very exciting. Every step we take to bring together the objects to the indigenous communities, the more dense their historical relation become, and the nature of the museum is more poignantly questioned. And it is not a matter of the museum being a place of injustice, but rather that the museum could, be, could become, in a near future, irrelevant if it doesn't allow the objects to continue their travel and to continue enriching their diasporic condition. Thank you. Um, so this is a very recent development of uh, the research that, that is happening right now in Leticia. Um, and we haven't done uh, a modification to the exhibition. So actually the museum is very, um, ha ha it, it hasn't have 
a lot of information about the objects, but its, its mere presence in the exhibition uh, could be very sensitive. So what we are trying to do right now is to collect more information about the secrets of the objects and how they interact with today communities. Because, as I said, it is um, very interesting that at the beginning of the process, nobody said anything about that. So what I am thinking now is that probably they were afraid that we were not going to open the museum if they said something like that. But also what is <coughs> happening is that after the museum opened, we have been uh, in contact with new indigenous leaders. And some of these indigenous leaders are tracing their histories back even further than the ones we met at the first time. So these new indigenous leaders are actually asking elderly people how they feel about these objects. So what I hope it would happen, it will happen in the near future, is that we get and we arrive to an agreement of how to exhibit or not to exhibit the objects. And I think both options are, are perfectly fine and perfectly understandable. Uh, but right now we are just in the process of continuing the research of the meanings of some of these objects. It happened specifically, specifically to two sculptures, which were, which are very significant objects of the collection, and because of that, of that significance, it's even more surprising that at the first time of the questioning we did with communities, uh, these issues didn't arise. Uh, so now we are wondering why, why are they arising today, and what that this means for their own political processes. How do you decide who to work with? In yeah. terms of, uh... So our first approach was to work with indigenous people close to the museum. So between 1998 and 2008, the museum was uh, mainly the ethnographic room uh, with the exhibition uh, and some educative and cultural services. And what has been consistent during this time is that we have hired uh, indigenous people to work with us. And there's a very mm, close relationship between indigenous population and public institutions in Leticia. For instance, not only in the cultural services of the Central Bank, but also in the National University of Colombia, which has um, a location in Leticia, and with other uh, public investigation institutions, indigenous people work with them, uh, trying to reinvigorate their own knowledges and practices of traditional uh, working. Uh, so in a way, they were very close to us. And that's also what is happening right now. We opened, uh, with the museum now uh, in view, we opened the collection to other people some people who were not that close to the museum. And we looked for them in order to do that, to try to comprehend uh, in a more general way how are they feeling about the collection. Because we had, and we understood this later in the process, we had a very uh, close view of how they would feel about this. And now extending the scope of our research, we are finding out these contradictory meanings and these contradictory feelings. But that's also part of their own history because Leticia and the settlements around Leticia are contradictory themselves. And so you would find some indigenous living in Leticia, right in Leticia in the city, which is interesting because they have the traditional settings right outside Leticia, but they are rather working in the city trying to uh, man maintain their links to some uh, home that was lost at the beginning of the century. So it is a very complicated situation and what we are trying to find out is how extended or how uh, restricted are these feelings and how should the museum engage with them. Thank you very much. I, it was really interesting and I, I like the way you are unpacking the, um, those kind of complexities and the changes. Really interesting. I think I haven't quite understood though the relationship between the uh, the bank 
gold museum and the ethnographic yeah. museum. And just within that, because that seems uh, brought with complexity and yeah. uh, you know challenges and politics, the the um, this di diplomatic purpose, because in some senses, it's kind of a, it's a sleight of hand as well, you know. So there, on the one hand, there's this, and of course, this is this is common to many museums. Um, this kind of openness to the indigenous communities and so on, a gesture towards empowering mm. their, you know, them. At the same time as co-opting that in a PR process or a diplomatic mission, as you say, to, to disguise the history, presumably, which is about resource exploitation and human labor exploitation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. is there no critical um, dimension locally within that? Okay, so I, I tried to mention that in previous versions of the presentation, and the presentation was like 45 minutes longer. So <laughs> uh, that's why I didn't mention it, that um, the, the complex uh, link of these different museums with the bank, and I will try to address it very shortly uh, in order to answer some of your uh, questions. So the first thing uh, to keep in mind is that the most important anthropological collection of the bank is that of the Gold Museum, which is basically an archaeological museum made of this kind of objects. These are uh, from around Bogota, but you would find from around uh, almost all of the country. So here's where the diplomacy begins, because uh, the bank owned these kind of objects because it had the monopoly of buying gold until right the 1990s. And at some point of its history, in 1939, it decided to stop um, melting gold uh, indistinctly, but acquiring these kind of objects and collecting them. And the intention was for an elite um, pursuing their own national identity to have a collection to be proud of in front of the world. So this is the origin of the cultural activity related to <coughs> anthropological uh, purposes of the, of, the, of the central bank. So when they opened this museum in Leticia, it is very interesting to see that they don't have a collection of gold in Leticia. Yeah? And you would say it is because in the Amazon there's no gold, and that's, that could be an answer. But also, you could say that they were, inter they were not interested in showing this gold in Leticia because they were interested in showing the living indigenous communities as part of this national history. So there goes a kind of um, appropriation of not only the image and the working of the indigenous people, but also of linking them with the archaeological past, which is a very tricky thing to do because they are not part of this past, they are part of this present. And something that you see um, frequently in the um, visitor's book of the museum is that they are very thankful for the exhibition of their ancestors' culture, as if they were already dead. And these kind of tricky things that happens in the museum, I think are part of this, um, of this central bank uh, heritage and contribution to, to the cultural activity uh, in the country. And yeah, I, I would uh, emphasize that. I would say that this is part of uh, a very selected group of people trying to keep their own image good for the rest of the country. And the institutional image of the bank and of the work they are doing uh, separated from the politics of their actual work. And this, I think, works very, very, very good in between the citizens <coughs> of Colombia. Because at some point, you won't even recognize some of the institutions, some of the cultural institutions, as belonging to the bank. It is, it is quite wonderful, but it's quite complicated. 
Um, the international dimensions of indigenous people in the museum are not uh, addressed directly. So what has happened is that uh, we have tried to make some connections with some indigenous initiatives in other countries, mainly in Brazil. Uh, there's a city called um, Ah, me olvido. Ah, the Ticuna city. Benjamin Constant. In Benjamin Constant, there's a Ticuna community museum, very, very important to the Ticuna political movement in the Amazon. And we are trying also to work with some museums in uh, Belém do Pará, right at the ocean uh, in, in the Brazilian coast. Um, but what we had learned also is that these international frontiers are at the same time invisible for the indigenous communities and they perceive themselves as part of a larger ethnic group, but at the same time they are very relevant because of the indigenous, um, because of the national politics that approaches the indigenous communities. And in Colombia, although the Amazon is fairly a historically relegated region, the Amazonian Indian is kind of a very well appreciated Indian, you know, like an image, an stereotypical image. And it has affected a lot how indigenous people relate to the imagination of the national country. And it is very different from what is happening in Brazil and in Peru. And the Ticuna people uh, who live in, in Leticia, but also the Huitoto, the Winani, or the Yukuna that are Colombian, uh, they see the advantages of belonging to a country that at, at least institutionally recognizes uh, more rights than in other countries. So it is a strange situation and we have to deal it uh, not only with other indigenous people in other countries but also with other experts in those countries to address it fairly. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm still recovering from a, quite a big cold, so I hope my voice is not leaving me. Um, so. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a very specific case study, something that is happening right here um, at the museum. And you can actually see, I think, if you look through there, you can see the waka, the canoes. Uh, so my uh, talk is entitled Diasporic Waka in the Dutch Museum, Fostering and Mediating Relationships. Uh, so since 2010, there are two waka, a waka tete kura, so that's a kind of everyday waka, um, and a waka tawa, which is made out of kauri wood and which is a ceremonial waka. And so since 2010, they are here at the Leiden's um, Museum Volkenkunde. <coughs> Uh, waka are an important icon of Maori culture and indeed of Aotearoa New Zealand. So the waka is kind of a natural object around which uh, to col collaborate. Waka reflect the maritime traditions of the Maori people. They also reflect Maori identity and the role of Maori culture in contemporary New Zealand society. Uh, so they are used to welcome important visitors to the country and also to mark significant e events for the nation. So, but how, uh, I'm going to start with, how did these uh, waka actually come here to the Netherlands? And why did it come to the Netherlands? So why not to any other country? So in this uh, question is, what is the relationship between um, New Zealand and the Netherlands? So historically speaking, the relationship or the link started in 1642, when the Dutch navigator, Abel Tasman, uh, became the first European to encounter Maori people in uh, New Zealand. And this encounter uh, turned out rather negative for the Dutch because a few of the uh, men uh, died. Uh, 
on the northern tip of uh, the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, so the name of the uh, non-ceremonial waka that we have here in the museum is actually acknowledging this encounter because it's called Tahimana, which is um, Maori for Tasman. Uh, so about 300 years later, New Zealand and the Netherlands became closer again. At the end of the Second World War, many Dutch people immigrated to New Zealand. And so by, by 1968, there were about 24,000 Dutch people living in New Zealand. Uh, still today, some of their descendants are keen on keeping cultural roots alive through Dutch clubs and through celebrations like, for example, Sinterklaas. So what you see here on this image is the opening of a, a, a unique cultural center. It's a Dutch Maori cultural center in Foxton. Um, and so you see the kind of the Dutch mill, but next to it is the um, Maori Museum, which is kind of constructed as a contemporary meeting house, Maori meeting house. And so the um, uh, slide below uh, shows some of the Dutch descendants celebrating their Dutch uh, heritage during the opening of that uh, museum. Um, so then the museum's relationship with New Zealand uh, started in 2002 when the National Museum of New Zealand, Te Papa Tongarewa, issued a request to return a tattooed head, a moko mokai, which was held here in, the, in Leiden. The request was granted in 2005, and the Te Papa representative, um, Arapata Hakiwai, who you can see on the, on the right, uh, together with my predecessor, Dirk Smit, accompanied the moko mokai to its ancestral home. Other Maori-related projects followed, such as the exhibition held by um, the photographic exhibition um, of Ans Westra's uh, work. And Ans Westra is actually um, a Dutch-born New Zealander. She was born here in Leiden, <coughs> and um, she, she migrated, um, immigrated to New Zealand when she was 21 year old. But she focused very much in her work on Maori life and Maori events, and also Maori protests, actually. Mm, so then in 2010, uh, the museum acquired a few Maori objects, uh, some of which are really important in, in the whole kind of Maori history and the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, which I will uh, talk about a little bit later. So all these aspects together um, influenced the then director, Stephen Engelsman, to propose what he called a waka for Leiden, a waka for Europe. Um, so in 2010, this proposition received funding and the original idea was to have a waka, so a canoe, for the general public to paddle in. Um, however, uh, talking to the Maori communities, uh, they thought the waka, the canoe, was too much important, too, uh, too um, important to the, a symbol for Maori culture uh, to allow just anyone to paddle in, in such a canoe. And uh, so they didn't want to jeopardize its status by um, it being treated respectfully. And so the compromise was that we would have a, a two waka, actually, so waka te te kura, so that's the kind of everyday waka, um, and, um, and then, uh, for, which is also used for general, uh, can be used by everyone, and it's for general uh, purposes, um, so that everyone can have an experience of Maori culture. Uh, and then there was also the waka tawa, which is used for Maori cultural purposes only. Um, the opening of the um, exhibition that we had in 2010 coincided with the handover, the official handover of this uh, waka. So within the Netherlands, the responsibility for upholding Maori principles and ideas that inform behavior and customs relating to the waka uh, are shared between Museum Volkenkunde and between the Njord Roy Royal uh, Rowing Club. Um, and the museum is responsible for the care and maintenance of the waka, and the Njor and your Rowing Club uh, are in charge of the crew. Legal ownership, however, of the ceremonial waka uh, remains with Toi Maori Aotearoa, and they are a charitable trust and umbrella organization supporting contemporary Maori arts nationally and internationally. Um, so, having uh, sketched the sh kind of shaping of the waka project, I argue, using William Safran's definition of diasporas, that certainly the waka tower, so the ceremonial waka, uh, shows characteristics of a diasporic object. 
I'm not going to read the whole uh, definition, but I'm just going to argue how the waka fits in that. Um, so uh, the definition applied or translated to the ceremonial waka uh, then becomes, you can say that the waka has been dispersed from New Zealand to a peripheral place, which is the Netherlands. And even though the dispersal is on purpose, it's still a dispersal. And so that's, that kind of alludes to, to what uh, Paul Basso was saying. You have different kinds of diasporas. They are not necessarily kind of negative uh, diasporas. Um, the link to um, the memory to the homeland is very clear in this object. And both the waka, so both the ceremonial and the, and the everyday waka, with the boathouse that you can see there, they stand out in the Netherlands. So one can consider that the waka will, uh, are not fully accepted in the Netherlands, are not fully part of the landscape of the Netherlands, and probably never will be. Um, so the fourth point, the waka tower can always return home uh, because it's alone. And so when there is a feeling the museum or Njord are not looking after it in an appropriate way, they will, uh, it will return home. Um, then the fifth point, Toi Maori and the Nga Waka Federation. So the, um, Toi Maori has all these kind of subdivisions. And one of the subdivisions is the uh, division looking after waka, after canoes. And so they are called the Nga Waka Federation. Uh, so the Nga Waka Federation uh, consider um, the waka as a way to show the richness of Maori culture outside of Aotearoa, Aotearoa New Zealand. And so they thus uh, contribute to the empowering of Maori communities at home. And finally, the importance of the waka is defined by the ongoing relationship with New Zealand. So that's a very important uh, aspect. And that brings me to the next point, the waka, looking at the waka as nodes for active relationships. Uh, so what transpires from Safran's definition is the enduring relationship diaspora communities maintain between the ancestral homeland and the host country. So the waka are nodes for an active relationship with the homeland, but are equally important in building a home for itself through the relationship with people of the host country and other people of the same diaspora. So the objects from the start were always conceived as um, relationship builders. And one of the things that you can uh, see this, um, through one of the things you can see this in, is the names that were given to the, uh, to the waka, to the canoes. Uh, so the everyday waka, as I said before, was called um, uh, Tahimana, so which uh, shows the relationship with the past, so that the Netherlands and New Zealand have with each other. Uh, but they also gave a kind of more active and outlooking uh, name, uh, so looking at the present and the future, with the ceremonial waka, which is called uh, Te Honokiao Te Aroa, which means the link with New Zealand. So it's constantly linking this um, uh, object to New Zealand and making the link with the Netherlands as well. Uh, not only the names that were given, but also the conditions under which the waka arrived in the Netherlands point to wish to build a relationship. The uh, everyday waka was bought. However, the um, waka tawa was given as a loan. And loans imply that parties involved have to keep in touch about the condition of the objects. In the Pacific, loans are increasingly, increasingly chosen over simple, you can call them uh, simple returns of uh, objects. And I want to illustrate this point of the importance of the loan um, uh, with an example that happened two years ago at the Bishop Museum in Hawaii. Uh, so on the 17th of March, 2016, the Bishop Museum welcomed a feather cloak and a helmet, um, which had been worn by one of the high chiefs of the big island Hawaii. Um, so this chief was called uh, Kalani Opu'u, and when he greeted Captain James Cook, he was wearing these two uh, objects, these two, um, this cloak and the helmet, and he draped it over the shoulders of uh, James Cook and also um, gave him the, uh, the helmet. And that was a demonstration of goodwill on his part, on the part of the high chief of, um, of um, Hawaii. Um, and so, uh, this object, these objects are kept at the Te Papa Museum in New Zealand. Uh, 
And so they returned these objects to Hawaii. And so on the first, uh, on first glance, this looks like a kind of a, a, a classic return of objects, but actually this is a 10-year loan. So which means that they constantly have to keep in touch with each other, talking about this loan and how it's going to be displayed, how it's going to be uh, treated, when there are problems. So, and, and, um, and if things are not treated in a kind of um, respectful way, uh, from, um, from both parties, they can actually uh, break this relationship. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a very important uh, thing about also this waka, that it is alone. So that's something that you have to consider. You have to talk to each other because it's alone. Um, and so <coughs> Museum Volkenkunde has been really looking at ways, exploring ways to keep the relationship alive around both uh, the canoes. Um, and that was um, especially relevant, this idea of keeping the relationship alive, after the exhibition that um, happened in 2010, when the Waka arrived, um, when that ex exhibition closed. Because during the exhibition, there were a lot of Maori people coming, giving workshops, um, <coughs> um, while well, helping with documenting the collection. So there was a lot of kind of... Uh, active relationship going on. But what happened when the exhibition closed was, uh, was much more difficult. And so we have been thinking in the museum of how we can actually do this. And so we, um, um, uh, we, are, now, we are now holding a yearly Waka event, so Waka weekend. So every year, uh, the weekend of the British Labor Day, Bank Holiday, the museum organizes a Waka weekend during which the knowledge is shared and exchanged. exchanged. <coughs> the aims of the weekend are to foster relationships between the museum, Toi Maori, the Nga Waka Federation, Njord, Ngati Ranana. Ngati Ranana is the London Maori Club, uh, which was established a uh, little more than 50 years ago in London. Uh, Kohangareo Oranana is also um, the London-based uh, language group that uh, are um, teaching Maori children or children that have, are of Maori descent uh, the Ma Maori language. And also uh, foster, so the other thing that we want to do is foster relationships with the New Zealand Embassy in The Hague. Um, the second thing is also looking after the physical and cultural condition of both the Wakatete and uh, the Wakatawa. And then the third thing that we are aiming for during these weekends as well is create community around the Waka in Europe. <coughs> and the parties involved in all this, uh, in every weekend actually, are the museum staff, of course, but also again, Toi Maori Aotearoa, Nga Waka Federation, the Royal uh, <coughs> Rowing Club, uh, Nga Tiranana, Kohangareo, and the New Zealand Embassy, and volunteers as well. Uh, so this is just a few slides to give you an idea of what is actually happen happening during these weekends. Uh, so we have, uh, there's always a big involvement of the London Maori Club, Nati Ranana, uh, who are giving workshops, are uh, sharing uh, stories, but we also always try to have uh, some involvement of Toy Maori. And every three, year, uh, every three years, there's also a big weekend where uh, Toy Maori is uh, present in, in greater numbers. Uh, so last year, even though it was not a big weekend, we had uh, Maori weavers uh, coming over to uh, teach um, the museum, but also to, to teach Njord how they have to uh, and can look after the cloaks that they wear during uh, when they perform in the uh, waka. Um, <clears throat> so we also had in 2016 the kind of the looking after the physical condition of the of the walk and the, the boat has. So here the uh, boat has received a new coat of paint, and so that was really very much a communal activity where everyone uh, who feels a connection to the waka can participate in. Uh, so then relationships are further activated during uh, special occasions. So outside of the waka weekend. Um, <coughs> and so here are just, is just a brief overview of some of the acti activities that the Waka has participated in. Uh, so in 2011, uh, it participated in the City of London Festival. Um, <coughs> and New Zealand was a, was a, a, a feature country during this festival. 
So um, people from Toi Māori, from New Zealand, came over, and some Njord members also paddled uh, the, the waka on the River Thames. Um, and then in 2012, it was a very busy year for the waka, <laughs> because it participated in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee pageant. And so there it was, um, uh, so New Zealand, um, all the kind of Commonwealth countries were invited to um, um, well, have their vessels on the River Thames. And so New Zealand chose to have the waka as a representative of New Zealand. Um, so then also, the, um, because New Zealand was uh, the feature country again in the uh, um, Frankfurt uh, Buchmesse, so the book um, um, festival. <laughs> um, and so uh, New Zealand was uh, showing all kinds of cultural um, uh, things related to New Zealand. And so the Waka again was invited to uh, participate in this uh, event as well. Um, in 2013, there was an exhibition uh, by contemporary uh, indigenous artists, which was called Suspended Histories and happened at the Museum van Loon. Um, and one of the artists was Lisa Rehana. And um, <coughs> she, um, she has a, a close connection to the Waka through her paternal ancestry. And so she f uh, thought it was very important because she was uh, showing her work in the Netherlands to also have her uh, kin actually present in the Netherlands through uh, the Waka. Um, because the Waka Tower, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, cannot be paddled by, uh, by women, um, she uh, chose to have the everyday Waka as a show of her uh, kin being present here. Um, then uh, the Waka also opened the uh, Rowing World Championships uh, in Rotterdam, 2016. And then very recently, last year, just a few months ago actually, uh, the Waka Tawa went to Ypres to commemorate the Battle of Passendale. And the battle is considered New Zealand's worst military disaster. Uh, within two hours, 846 New Zealanders uh, were killed. Um, and, uh, and further 2,000 uh, were wounded. Uh, for this uh, very kind of, um, yeah, very special event, the New Zealand Embassy in Belgium invited the Waka to come and paddle and participate in this uh, commemoration uh, event. And so uh, four um, paddlers from Njord uh, were allowed to participate in this event, and the other eight uh, were uh, paddlers from uh, New Zealand, from the Ngawaka Federation. Uh, so then the everyday waka also com uh, participated in the commemoration of the Abel Tasman year, uh, to, um, and that was 375 years of Abel Tasman uh, uh, encountering uh, Maori people. Um, and, um, and there that was completely, um, uh, well, that was organized by the New Zealand Embassy in the Netherlands, but it was very much Njord that was uh, looking after and, and doing the ceremonial part of the, of the activities. Uh, also because of the um, waka, so the waka allows for the Njord members uh, to go to New Zealand every year, and that's really to resource themselves and to, to learn uh, more about the culture and the protocols that are attached to the waka. And this um, going to New Zealand, it's always every year at the, on the 6th of February, where they participate in the um, commemorations around the tr signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, and uh, the Treaty of Waitangi is a very important uh, aspect of, uh, of Maori culture, but also of New Zealand culture, because uh, the treaty was signed in 1840, and it's still today considered the founding document of, uh, of the New Zealand nation. It was, was signed between um, a, a representative of the, of the British Crown and um, more than 100 uh, Maori chiefs, uh, mainly from the North Island. Uh, and in, in that document, they negotiated the kind of relationship um, the British Crown was going to have uh, to the land, to New Zealand, and Maori chiefs were going to have to, uh, to the land. And um, because of differences in the Maori text and in the English text, um, the, it's still not clear what the rights exactly are. And so there are still today, there are, there's a Waitangi tribunal uh, 
where claims are made and are uh, discussed and looked at what Maori people actually can do, what kind of um, rights they have to the land. <coughs> so yeah, that's just a sheet, one of the nine sheets of the um, Waitangi Tribunal, um, uh, the Waitangi uh, document. Um, so um, in relation to kind of uh, the waka acting as nodes, I want to uh, look at, at some of the, of the well, a quote made by Emmanuel Casarerou, and he was talking uh, about New Caledonian material culture. Um, and he says that you should look at the objects being elsewhere from a kind of different perspective. He says, if objects have left the home country, we should not focus on their absence, but on the idea that they have been sent to achieve something. So the waka, you can also very much uh, say that the waka, uh, both waka actually, are living up to this challenge of achieving something here. Um, and so that's, that comes to the next, uh, my last part, which is about ownership, authority, and access. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> the past decade, decades have seen numerous publications and discussions centered around the position of historic objects in relation to originating communities. And some of the questions um, posed during all these discussions um, I'm going to address here. So should the objects be returned to their originating communities? Who has the right to speak for museum objects? How can access be guaranteed, taking into account indigenous views of accessibility along gender lines or secret, sacred uh, notions? Uh, can objects be handled in ways that are appropriate and meaningful to the indigenous communities concerned? Um, and so these questions are about ownership, authority, and about access. And the waka, as a museum object that can actually be handled and that can be touched and used, exemplify and shed a new light on some of, some of these questions. <coughs> so the fact that the waka uh, tawa, so the ceremonial waka, is alone, um, um, answers, of course, immediately the question whether the waka should be returned or can be returned to the origina um, originating community. Uh, the waka will return to the originating community. We know that. Um, we don't know when exactly, but we know it, it will, it's destined to return at some point. Um, originally, it was signed for, um, well, it was kind of stipulated that it was going to be for 100 years. But of course, if um, the parties involved uh, feel that it's not appropriate for the waka to be here anymore, um, it can be, um, it can go back to the originating community and the originating community in this case is a, a community in the north, uh, northern tip of the North Island. <coughs> but also the loan uh, means um, that it has to be, that you constantly have to uh, talk about this. So here you just see the signing of the deed, so that's the the intention um, that we had, how we were going to work with this uh, waka. So then we come to another important point, and who has the right to speak for the waka? Uh, and so this is something that is constantly being negotiated. Um, so we see that um, there are three main parties involved, and that's Toi Maori, that's the uh, museum, and that's Njord. And for the waka tawa, uh, this relationship is quite clear, actually. For everything that is happening with the ceremonial waka, we have to discuss this with, um, with Toi Maori. And, um, and they discuss it with Nga Waka Federation as well. Um, so uh, we can make, we can have uh, events, but we always have to see whether that's appropriate for, uh, to Maori protocol. With the uh, everyday waka, it's more flexible. So the museum and Njord can have their own activities as long as we feel, because we have been, um, um, as long as both Njord and, and the museum feels, that it's appropriate. Um, we have been uh, given this task and we are, are being trusted in making the right decisions. So we are much more flexible in that uh, regard. But for the Wakatawa, it's, it's quite uh, strict. Um, 
And um, so for the uh, third uh, kind of uh, question, how can access be guaranteed, taking into account indigenous views of accessibility along gender lines and or sacred secret notions? Um, and this is also a very tricky one because the Wakatawa is, um, uh, Toy Maori has ha have uh, stipulated that the Wakatawa can only be paddled by man and not by any man, <laughs> but by man who know all the protocols. So that's, that's very uh, limiting. <laughs> Um, and the, the idea of, because a lot of, well, especially here in the Netherlands, has met with quite some resi resistance, why only man? And the idea is that it uh, comes from, uh, that the Wakatawa was originally a war canoe, and that um, sending uh, uh, women into war, you uh, risk, if you lose women, you risk uh, losing the whole community because no children are going to be born anymore. So you, you, you will be decimated, really. Um, um, and even though there have been women in the past, women warriors going in, into canoes, uh, Toi Maori has chosen to have uh, this more kind of conservative view of, of how to deal uh, with the waka. And even this is being negotiated by Toi Maori themselves. <coughs> um, and uh, this is very clear also uh, with questions that have come from Njord as well, because the Njord, uh, um, uh, the female Njord uh, members um, have asked whether they could be involved more actively in some of the um, uh, aspects of the, of the waka. And uh, Toi Maori has responded very positively actually to that. So they are uh, now when uh, uh, Njord members go to, um, to New Zealand, uh, they make sure that there is a female, an all-female waka uh, crew, uh, so that also women can um, uh, get more knowledge about how to do the female part of the of the waka um, aspects. Um, and also in um, in Yord, they have uh, tried to kind of balance this out a little bit. So the the leader of the ceremonial waka for Yord is uh, Justus Hamann, who's a man. Um, but for the uh, everyday waka, it's uh, Mirta Hazes, who's a, wom a woman. So she's the leader, and she does all the calls for the uh, waka, uh, uh, waka tete, so for the everyday waka. And so uh, to uphold all the kind of uh, protocols as well, there is um, uh, there is uh, one um, person appointed as well, who knows all the karakia, so that's the prayers, who knows the calls, uh, the karanga, um, who knows, um, who also kind of leads and calls the haka, the appropriate dances, the appropriate poetry uh, that is happening. So he, he knows all that and is responsible for uh, safeguarding that here in the Netherlands. <coughs> so uh, to conclude, um, in an earlier article, um, a sh very short article, uh, that was entitled Awakening Sleeping Objects, uh, that was written to accompany an exhibition in Cambridge Pacif called Pacifica Styles, I have argued that many contemporary Pacific peoples consider that objects are sleeping if there are no people around to pick them up or to touch them and comfort them. So I would argue that for diasporic objects, such as the waka, it is the people who activate the objects, making it possible to function as nodes, as focal points for relationships. So the relationship between your, the museum, Toi Maori, the Ngawaka Federation, Nati Ranana, the London Maori Club, uh, and the uh, Kohanga Reo, uh, the language club, are strengthened and rekindled during the re yearly Waka weekends. And especially for the London group, the Waka becomes, becomes a home away from home. It is an object that, like them, lives in diaspora, but also, like them, plays an important role in displaying and, and, um, and living the richness of Maori culture abroad. Uh, then a second concept I think is important uh, uh, with respect to the waka is the, con the Tongan concept of langa fonua. Uh, langa fonua means literally building the land, building the nation, building the country. And I think it's useful in thinking about the way the waka works for Maori people living in the homeland, living in New Zealand. Uh, Ping Ann Addo, so I've taken this concept from her book, 
um, about a Tongan uh, bark cloth, about, um, so that's, yeah, bar bark cloth. Uh, but Tongan bark cloth made and used and handled by women living in New Zealand, Tongan women living in New Zealand, so living in the Tongan uh, diaspora, um, and who have no direct access to uh, Tonga, especially. And so she argues that Tongan women, through their handling of bark cloth, wherever they are, engage in an ongoing exchange that contributes to the augmentation of the nation. So they build the nation from far away, actually. And um, so transposing this onto the waka, uh, I would say that um, the waka fosters a great sense of pride uh, for not only for the people who are directly involved, so for the peddlers, for the Ngawaka Federation, but also for the for Maori people in general, because it reflects positively on Maori people in New Zealand. The waka gets mentioned, gets really honourful mentions in uh, New Zealand radio, television, and in printed media. So hence, through the handling uh, of the waka, Maori people are contributing to the cultural enrichment, to the building of the homeland, uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so you can see that it, it's really very varied what they, um, uh, the mentions that are uh, given of the waka here in the Netherlands. So this is a, just a newspaper art article that appeared um, last year. Um, but it also gets mentioned by the uh, Ministry of Culture on their website. So you can see that there is a waka here, and so that's kind of a sense of pride for all Maori people who uh, feel kind of connected to this waka here. Um, there's also um, uh, publicity made for a documentary that was made about this waka uh, project. Um, there's on Maori television, uh, for example, when the waka participated in the Passchendaele uh, commemorations, it got a, a special feature on Maori television talking about what this waka was doing here in the, uh, well, in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and how this kind of uh, instates a sense of, of pride. Um, so um, I think for the waka works in, in two different ways. It works very much for kind of um, for Maori communities here in Europe, but also for in, um, in, uh, for Maori communities in New Zealand as well. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Roland, for a really, it very in-depth and fascinating <coughs> story about the Waka uh, and, and the project. What would be some more general ideas, lessons that could be learned from, from, from the Waka project for ethnographic museums? Yeah, this is, this is a very kind of unique project because mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a kind of uh, object that was collected in a historical context. It's very much something that was, from the start, uh, set up as a collaborative project. Uh, so that makes it quite different from, from other kind of museum objects that have been in museum for 100 years, for, for example. Um, but I think one of the things that can be uh, learned is that um, the parties involved in, um, in dealing with uh, objects, whether they be historic or not, um, that it's, um, it's something that both parties have to be kind of involved in, in on an equal footing. Um, and there has to be a lot of uh, uh, conversation and dialogue. And it's uh, very time consuming, but it's also very re rewarding if you do, if you do that. Um, and so it's, that's why I think the kind of concept of a loan is also very central to this, uh, because loans for me really allow this kind of conversation to happen and, and force all the parties involved to have this con uh, constant conversation. It's, um, it's, it's really not always easy, because even for the waka, where it's not a historic object, uh, these conversations are, um, are not, not easy. And even though it might seem that it's very clear who has the kind of ownership, um, it's the involvement of, for example, uh, the London Maori Club uh, complicates this uh, relationship very much. And in the beginning, um, if I'm totally honest, uh, Toy Maori was not uh, in favor of having uh, the London Maori Club uh, really very much involved in this whole uh, project. 
And I think that's, that's something that we as a museum can do to kind of perhaps complicate the relationship. <laughs> Uh, because we, I, well, I, I thought it was very much very important that the uh, Maori people living in Europe were felt a connection and were involved in this whole project, and so that was something that we had to negotiate also with Toy Maori and with um, and with, with the museum, with the, the people in, in, in mainly in the UK, uh, live there where they live. So it's 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 yeah, even when it's it seems straightforward, it's not. <laughs> <coughs> in some senses, the um, everyday waka is the more interesting one to think think through, yep. because that's more akin to the you know thinking about how what what lessons we can take from this. Clearly, you know, it's it's an exemplary mm -hmm. kind of contemporary collecting kind of project, yep. um, which is which is really great to think about. Um, thinking in a hundred years' time, you know, so the loan goes back. That, that, that one seems quite straightforward, but the other one, it seems very interesting to me, particularly when we think about how we know what we know about the majority of the objects in our collections. You know, so the assumption that well, this has no ceremonial purpose; it can be done. You know, can do whatever you want. So we don't know for the majority of our collections what conditions, what context, with, and they're imputed in hindsight. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a ceremonial object. Mm -hmm. It may be, it may not be, mm -hmm. it may have been commissioned um, uh, in a different way that meant that it didn't, it didn't get sacralized or turned, you know. Mm -hmm. And yet, and yet, because of the, because of the rupture of time, um, they're left in this ambiguous kind of position. So in some senses to, you know, to track to track the histories of these two would be the fascinating thing, because that's when perhaps we'll learn about the message they can tell us about these historic collections. So I don't know if you, you know. Um, yeah, no, I, but I think even even though we think we know <laughs> what the relationship is, mm -hmm. it's actually constantly evolving, and that's also one of the interesting things. Um, that is happening actually with both uh, waka, because even with the ceremonial waka, it's constantly being negotiated what can actually happen with this waka, because some things that, um, for example, uh, it's participating in the Diamond uh, Jubilee, it was not necessarily meant to do that kind of thing, so it's constantly being kind of rethought what is actually, uh, what it means to have a ceremonial waka, and what it allows uh, the museum to do, but also Maori communities to do. And uh, also who can be involved, because actually what I didn't say is that for the um, Maori, uh, for the Queen's uh, Diamond Jubilee, uh, initially Toy Maori was very much against having uh, the London Maori Club participate in this, but through the uh, um, participation of the Wakatawa, of the ceremonial waka in the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, actually Toy Maori kind of rethought their view on this, and a number of uh, toy, um, uh, Ngati Ranana people were involved in paddling the, the waka. So something that was initially seen as that's absolutely not possible kind of was rethought of in, yeah, perhaps it, it is necessary to rethink this uh, relationship. And also with the waka te te kura, <coughs> that's, that's um, there the kind of the, the um, negotiation <coughs> is, has a faster pace, I would say, <laughs> uh, because you cannot do anything with it still, <laughs> even, even because, for example, you cannot uh, have alcohol on the, on the um, everyday waka. Um, and uh, so there are, there are still some restrictions, and it has to be treated in a, a respectful uh, way, uh, respectful of Maori protocol as well. Uh, but there, um, every, um, because it's a little bit more flexible, it's also the pace at which changes happen is much faster. <coughs> 
So um, now we will begin with the second section of the, um, of the symposium uh, with the diasporic objects and the construction of home. Uh, our first speaker in this section will be Maya Pufsranovic Flickman. Um, the title of her presentation will be Practices of Migrant Homing and Objects of Connection. Um, Maya is a professor of ethnology and uh, teaches at the Department of Global Political Studies in Malmö University in Sweden. She also is participating in research projects at Agde Forskning, uh, Kristiansand, uh, Norway teaching at the PhD program in ethnology and cultural anthropology at the University of Zagreb and coordinating the IMISCO um, research group TRANSMIC, which stands for Transnational Practices in Migration. Her main research interests are war-related experiences, refugee and labor migration, diaspora, transnational practices, highly skilled migrants, place, ethnicity, affect, and material culture. Um, she's currently engaged in two <coughs> projects that involve refugees that are entitled Exploring Integration as Emplaced Practice and Museums as Arenas of Integration, New Perspectives and Methods of Inclusion. So, if you would to come. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to see people I haven't met before and <coughs> among them some people I, I quoted in my work but haven't met before so I'm, I'm really, uh, really glad to be here. Um, uh, fortunately, this is the second part and, and you announced this as a something, something different now, the three papers that are that are coming here because I am going to talk about very different matters than, than those that that we've been listening about uh, in the morning or so far. Um, what you mentioned, uh, this project on museums as, as arenas of potential inclusion of refugees, the project that I'm involved in, it's actually lasting till the, yeah, till the end of August this year. What I didn't mention in my written information that was sent a couple of months ago is the most recent the most recent <coughs> published chapter of mine, which uh, was published in a book that came out only in December last year. It's called Museums in Town in the Times of Migration and Mobility. And my chapter is devoted to the notions of ethnicity, identity, culture, and diversity as the notions that are very often related to representation of migrants. I'm not a mu museum uh, worker. I have never worked professionally in any way with museums, but being an ethnologist uh, and uh, of course being a part of this dialogue on migration and what, what I as a migration scholar, ethnologist who is ethnographically working with migrants and topics that are uh, related to migration uh, can see and maybe contribute, I think it's, it's also probably relevant uh, to you. So if we have a minute later on, I can just go online so to show you this book because it's brand new. And in this article, I'm not trying to, to tell the museum people what to do uh, because I can't do that, but I hope that, <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that as a researcher of migration, who is like free not to think about how then to do this difficult work of representing, right? See things that I am having some 20 years of, of uh, having lived in Sweden, coming from Croatia where I originally got my education and my first 15 years of professional, professional work as a researcher. Things that I see do not fit the lived migrant re re realities. Uh, things that I see are not misrepresented, but what is and tends to be represented in museums, but also in any kind of different kind of texts <coughs> on migrants, is just one aspect of who they are and definitely what they do. So I also, coming from Croatia with different scholarships, etc., etc., I came <coughs> to Croatia following the refugees, following the migrants, and I thought I was doing research on Croatian diaspora in Sweden. I mean, 
soon thereafter, I could see that this makes sense only if we talk in statistical terms, like people count it as something, I mean, only on that level. Because what I could see was people who would say that, yeah, we are affiliated to the same ethnicity. But beyond that, it was internal perceptions of differences. That I, I, I mean, I could give several lectures on this, obviously, I'm not going to do it, okay? Uh, what I could see is, um, was conflict. What I could see was the struggle within all these different ethnic associations, which just in the town of Malmö, which by then was just over 300,000 people, there were six Croatian organizations. And then if you know anything about former Yugoslavia, it's all these other post-Yugoslav nations with their six, eight, and, and so on. I mean, just to, to ask a question, oh, why is that? If they're all a community, uh, now to the English speakers, native English speakers in this room, being someone who is not a native speaker and who has this critical critical uh, uh, kind of stance towards any kind of groupings. Of course, groups exist and they are very important to people in different contexts, in different ways. But talking in an uncritical manner about communities, which we see in professional literature in, in, in English language, I mean, I'm telling my students, whenever you want to say community, please explain at least in five sentences what exactly are you talking about, okay? So this is where I come from. I'm a scholar of migration who has, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, never worked in a museum. <laughs> but I'm here to point to some things that I find important. Uh, I came a long way from seeing myself or presenting myself as a researcher of diaspora or diasporic <laughs> communities to someone who sees that actually what is extremely interesting is not this presupposed spaces in between or not belonging or neither here or there, but actually what I see among the people, mostly people who are living in Sweden who came from different post-Yugoslav or Yugos Yugoslavia or post-Yugoslav countries, depending on if they were labor migrants or if they were refugees, uh, the ways that they connect different homes, the, days, the ways that they create their homes in Sweden in connection and definitely with some kind of materialities that are belonging both uh, here and there. So this is what I see, this is what I think is important uh, also to talk about here. Uh, I just want to make a note that streaming is, I'm very happy with streaming and if people are watching this I'm, I'm grateful that they're interested, but the much longer or more extensive version of what I'm going to talk about today has already been presented at, uh, as a keynote speech uh, in March last year in Göttingen at the CF conference, it's European Ethnologists Conference. And at the next uh, ethnologist conference in uh, Santiago de Compostela in, in April 19, there will also be a publication. So, so this piece uh, in its full extent will be published. Uh, so I just wanted to make a note about that. Okay. So here we go. Um, yeah. I'll let you think about these keys for a moment, uh, but I'm going to read my introduction here, saying that both anthropologists and ethnologists in engaged in studies of material culture have offered a respectable body of work concerning objectifi objectification, consumption, identity, and social memory. In the currently developing interdisciplinary interest in material culture, the focus on materiality has been increasingly recognized as fruitful also when it comes to research on migrants and their transnational practices. Migrants carry, send, and receive things across state borders. Coffee makers and teapots, candy, spices, used and new clothes, medicine, books, technical devices, and a myriad of other items of emotional, but also of practical value. Homemade food is smuggled in overloaded suitcases. Old shoes are repaired back home. Pieces of furniture traveling between the here of residence and the there of origin. The use of things from one place in another indicates functioning transnational connections, but also constitutes the material aspects of transnational dwelling. 
again, be, not being a native speaker of English, I'm for today using homing and dwelling as yeah, interchangeable terms. I'm not sure if that is uh, insensitive, but I'm talking about dwelling here in that sense. If dwelling is about being settled in an environment that accepts us and that we ourselves can accept, not only meanings and feelings are at stake, but also the subjectivity and how it connects to the physicality of dwelling or the materiality of dwelling. I therefore, in my work, suggest that attention is paid to objects that we use without noticing them. I will illustrate this by an autobiographical vignette. These are my keys. It's a story about a key that clarifies the interconnectedness between an object and a particular practice. The keys to my two homes in Croatia and Sweden always travel with me in both directions, even if someone is in the place at the other side to open the door for me. I carry them as providers of the immediate and practical possibility of re-entering my respective homes without having to ring the bell. However, in the first year or two in Sweden, that was in the late 90s, the supposedly taking for granted act of opening a door to my new home was not uh, entirely unproblematic. The very action of entering my home reminded me on a daily basis that ideas, behavior, and artifacts are codependent, that agency inheres in the interrelationship between the various entities that constitute the field of action. In actual fact, I was constantly being reminded of my foreignness. Every day, over and over again, I turned the key in the direction that is normal for the keyholes in Croatia, only to be reminded in that in Sweden this is the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. The opposite movement was needed. I don't know if anyone understands what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, you do. All right. Mm -hmm. While I understood, of course, that I was turning the key in the wrong way, the action was so habitual that it took me war more than a year to eliminate. I'm not inventing this to have a nice story in a paper. It's totally true. I could then enter my Swedish home without feeling irritated by a moment of interruption that caused a crack of normality of my being in another place. While the problem has been solved in Sweden, I found myself trying to enter my Croatian home the Swedish way. Again, this was it, time was necessary sorry, before matters settled and the key once again started to be used properly. Facing the locked door, one cannot relativize one's own position or negotiate it discursively. One is made aware of not having been there long enough to practice the act of entering. The door, the presumed gateway to your own place in a new context, resists habitual moves and becomes a physical rejection, rejection of an element of a foreign habitus. This account of a bodily felt abnormality describes how a normal daily activity was interrupted by migration and reestablishment over time. My engagement with the materiality in familiar and unfamiliar context, as well as the change of familiarity of here and there, yielded reflections on transnational emplacement through practice, and this is what I'm talking about here. Now, the transnational social spaces or fields, depending on whose author, which authors you, you quote, are defined as sets of social and symbolic ties between places, networks, and positions established and sustained as sec sets of practices. They provide plurilocal frames of reference, uh, uh, which structure every, uh, ref yeah, references, which structure everyday practices, social positions, biographical prospects and identities, and simultaneously exist above and beyond the social context and national societies. Transnational dwelling implies also plurilocal frames of material practices through which people can achieve that important aspect of well-being that is usually called feeling at home. I feel at home because I am at home, both here and there. Here and there of transnational dwelling are unstable categories. I mean, this is so crucial epistemologically also when we do research, because they depend on the location from which this phrase is uttered. Ideally, transnational dwelling means that one, one's being is in place in different locations. 
The analytical distinction between being and belonging, as proposed by Peggy Levitt and Nina Glick-Schiller, is crucial for an understanding of the role of objects in those processes. If conceptualizing the simultaneity of migrants' lives in transnational social fields, they distinguish between ways of being, the actual social relations and practices in which individuals engage in their everyday lives, and ways of belonging, practices that signal or enact identity and demonstrate a conscious connection to a particular group. So it was this kind of ways of belonging that we heard about uh, in the previous papers. While belonging combines action and an awareness of the kind of identity that action signifies, being in the social field does not necessarily mean that people identify with the labels, cultural politics, and representations associated with that field. Doing research on so-called diasporic communities, which in practice means organize people in associations, and hearing what they have to say, typically it's spokespersons or people who are very active in such association, can be very different from what you get to know, learn to know, if you also talk to people, go to people's homes, spend time with people who are affiliated to the <coughs> same group, but they are not part of the organized association life or whatever cultural activities. Um, we miss very much if we only talk to or get to know whatever realities through the eyes of the organized communities. I mean, as an ethnologist, as an ethnographer, I believe I don't have to tell this to <coughs> those of you who are employing the, the same methodologies, uh, but so much migration scholarship has been based on people going to spokespersons of particular organizations and, uh, and then generalizing <laughs> this as if this was uh, pertaining to like all crowds in Sweden. I mean, you know, it really doesn't make sense from an empirical point of view. So uh, one can lead a transnational life without ever signaling or enacting one's ethnic, national, or local identity. Or one may, cher may cherish objects that the signal belonging while at the same time possessing objects acquired in the country of origin that are not displayed but used. The problem is that researchers of migration tend to be more interested in the former, while the latter kind of objects remain underexplored. Flags on the walls, images of national heroes, or iconic landscapes are of course more imposing than, for example, stashes of non-prescription medicine in the bathroom closets bought when traveling to the home there, or perhaps coffee and sweets that traveled across borders. Objects can be carriers of expressions of different kinds of capital and reconfirm social ties in space and time. But th their role in negotiations of identities remains an empirical question, and I'm not dealing with that today. I urge you instead to think about how objects contribute to the continui continuity of the ways of being that renders the sense of normalcy. I attempt a phenomenologically informed analysis of processes of emplacement, that goes beyond the reduction to a nostalgic paradigm or the loss of true home and the yearning for return. It refers the urge of being at home to active searching for a place or creation of places in the circumstances of transnational dwelling where one feels in sync with oneself. I want to highlight the role of inconspicuous mundane objects in this process, since their habitual use appears as a crucial aspect of being, a facilitator of familiar senses and practices at the intersection of sociality and materiality of hominis. The examples I am sharing with you today stem from some 50 narrative interviews, ethnographic observations, and visual material obtained among labor, refugees, students, and family migrants in Sweden, uh, who came from a number of different countries, and uh, among returnees and non-migrant rel relatives in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. The starting empirical question was simple. Which objects are brought or sent from and to the migrant's homeland, and why? Any kind of things, project, products, food, that people carry, send, receive, and use across national borders may appear as 
objects of connection between migrants, those who stayed behind, and places located in different countries. Let me quote a young woman who moved to Iran, uh, from Iran to Sweden to study, but met a Swedish man, man to whom she's now engaged to be married. She visits Iran twice a year, but feels that she can go there whenever she wants and claims that this calms her down with regard to the decision about continuing her life in Sweden. She said that the visits to Iran always involve a lot of luggage, and I quote, I take and bring too many objects. I don't bring specific objects. I just bring things from spices and glass, meaning glassware, the tablecloths, towels, sheets, etc. They're not necessary at all. Last time I went to Iran, I brought our engagement rings from there. I bought a hair dryer, which is Remington, not Iranian, uh, a perfume, Saint Laurent, tablecloths, earrings, biscuits, tea, Venus Gillette, postcards, hair coloring, nail polish, and my sister's perfume that she no longer wanted. All objects that you will see in my slides, very similar to this random mix described in the quote, have been transported across state borders, both by migrants and by their non-migrant or counterparts. They were found in Swedish homes of people coming from Switzerland, Czech Republic, Bosnia, Gambia, Brazil, and the UK, in a home of a Swedish retinue from Germany, and in the homes in Croatia belonging to the parents of migrants, etc., etc. Okay? The photos here illustrate which types of objects dominate my material. Only the means of transportation and the related rules concerning the luggage weight and volume set the limits to the kinds of and quantities of things people say are not at all necessary, but continue bringing along. The reasons for bringing them across the borders are, of course, manifold. Heaps of old and new clothes and shoes crisscross the borders as personal items or as presents. Also, other kinds of objects embody personal relations and presents in other locations. That's just the types of objects. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Things can be recycled, used in one place after they've been used in another. They are sometimes replicated so that some kind of object is readily available at both ends for personal use or <coughs> at the occasion of visits by friends and relatives. Um, here we are. <laughs> and both new and old things can be transported across borders for what their users see is their superior quality, for example. Superior quality, definitely, presented like that. Or because they are seen as indispensable. And here we are talking about food and drinks and sweets and definitely very much food. Similar or even same products may be available in situ where one lives, but they are still sent or carried across borders. Uh, that is something I am actually writing about right now because it's a very challenging thing to, to kind of tease out why is this done. Because you can buy this. I'm not just talking about, of course, you can buy a box of chocolate, uh, but it's the box of chocolate that came from your country, from your original country, but you still like when this box of chocolate is sent by, I don't know, your parents or brought by your friend from the place. And uh, to kind of understand why this is the case is a challenge. I'm not going to, to share my ideas about it here, but I'm writing about it. Yeah. Sometimes the reason is lower price, but often it's simple, simply the matter of ease of access in a particular place. So uh, this kind of cleaning stuff, I mean, it's so, uh, yeah, you can't really understand it, but I'm trying to understand it, and I think it will be very <coughs> clever. <laughs> People are not only used to certain products, 
but uh, they say that they are used to obtaining them in a particular location there. Yeah. Um, I published some, some articles on this topic and uh, there was this example of a, of a medical doctor from, from Germany who travels to, for, um, who lives in Sweden, travels to Germany relatively oft often, and for several years he was buying garbage bags in Germany and bringing them to Sweden, <laughs> right? Simply because it's this ease of being here and there, and he knew in this particular local shop that he was used to where they were, and he was traveling by car, so all the you know facilities were there when it comes to infrastructure <laughs> and, and transportation, so he was doing this, right? Uh, or, or, or the example of people bringing shoes for repair in their original, with their original shoemakers. Uh, also a very interesting thing that people are laughing at themselves when telling about it, but they still keep doing it. And I think it's really telling us something about transnational practices and who they are. <laughs> okay? Objects brought or received from elsewhere can, of course, generate cultural meanings, obviously, and we heard a lot about that today and evoke feelings, obviously, but they also animate practices. It's the role of practical uses of objects from elsewhere in transnational dwelling that I'm discussing today. And um, yeah, um, here are such examples that, obvious, that are obvious, don't have to be commented, what kind of <laughs> practices they are involving. When an object is so much in use that daily life without it has become inconceivable or it's not even longer noticed, it doesn't make sense as a sign, but rather as part and parcel of a person's subjectivity. This is, for example, illustrated by Katie Walsh, who describes how a simple plastic ball received from her mother has a taken-for-granted presence in a British expat's home in Dubai. Ian Woodward said, uh, even the most emptied out banal objects of domestic material culture have a role to play in constituting the sense of normalcy. In probing the conditions for this self sense of normalcy, Pierre Bourdieu's notion of habitus <coughs> appears to me as very useful. In his logic of practice, uh, he elaborates how pr pr principles that generate and organize practices can be objectively adapted to their outcomes without conscious aiming at ends. However, Bourdieu was rather interested uh, in objects as reified cultural capital than in materiality as such. And he saw body as a memory pad through which learning takes place and is inscribed. Therefore, Ghassan Haj's discussion of Bourdieu's habitus is of special importance to me since he focuses on the materiality of the body and explains that habitus is both a manifestation and a measurement of how well a body is capable of deploying itself in a particular environment. While habitus generally refers to the internalization and sedimentation of experience on one hand, and the production of a generative capacity and the externalization of this capacity on the other, the related notion of hexis denotes a fusion between having, possessing an object, and being, being capable of an activity that lends a sense of normalcy. Hexis is a habitual and ongoing having whereby what is outside of me becomes an inseparable and durable part of me. It becomes me. There is a movement and a fusion between what I have and what I am. Furthermore, Bourdieu does not posit that everything people do or say is aimed as at maximizing their social profit but that it's aiming as perpetuating and aug augmenting their social being. His empirical existential analysis is directed towards the production and circulation of culturally specific ways of perceiving being, that is, whatever is contextually sensed as good, fulfilling, satisfying, and viable life. Thus, this analytical approach allows for investigating also how objects and material practices help migrants to feel that their transnational being is good, viable, and satisfying. In Ghassan Haj's words, um, sorry, am I fine here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
one can say that this habitus is a principle of homing and building, of striving to build the space where one can be at home in the world. When we say that a habitus fits its environment, it doesn't mean that there is some kind of imaginary turtle fit. Rather, it means that the habitus is part and parcel of an environment where it's capable of generating actions that strive to make us feel at home. In this sense, the accumulation of being generated by the habitus also embodies a more existential domain that Hajj calls the accumulation of homeliness and that I refer to more broadly in terms of normalcy in transnational dwelling. Now, for some more examples. Many of the photos I just showed you imply the materiality of habitus and it, it's clearly suggested how those objects are used. It's straightforward if you have a, yeah, a tablecloth or something, you know how you use it. Um, yet, of course, it's crucial to ask people about the histories or, and trajectories about particular, uh, of particular things and the reasons for them to need them in a particular location. A young woman from Iran living in Sweden, I already quoted, told about her kettle. I quote, I have asked my sister to bring a kettle and a teapot which I used on the stove. I wanted the kettle only to have the same routine and the same look as I had in Iran in my new kitchen in Malmö. The reason we still use this way of making tea is due to the high price of electricity in Iran. So we prefer to use gas and their stoves work with gas. Therefore, the usage of this kettle on the electric stove in Sweden is not logical and it takes longer time, higher costs and more energy." End quote. <laughs> so the material practice this woman was socialized into, into her native surroundings implies the use of this particular kind of object. She wants to have the same routine, as she said, in Sweden. The presence of this particular type of kettle not only evokes but materializes, makes tangible the continuity between two kitchens in two countries. The possibility of keeping up a habitual practice, which requires that the materiality at hand does not resist them, as in the example of my key, is crucial to the experience of emplacement. Albeit, albeit a small scale, on small scale and in a partial manner, such practices alleviate the sense of fragmentation and discontinuity in transnational dwelling. For the same reason, ordinary things travel not only from, but also back to the places of origin. So these are some, especially cookers, coffee makers, electronic water heaters, knives, cheese slicers, and a number of other kitchen devices from Sweden have been placed uh, in the households in the countries of origin. Note that these are the objects of daily use and that their practical aspects are clearly of primary importance. Sometimes the objects that migrants say they cannot be without are disguised as presents to the relatives living there, yet they're clearly about them wanting to make sure that they have them at hand when they're there. I mean, people reflect on that, say that. Yeah. Also, the non-prescription medicine one is familiar with appears as important. The more everyday and taken for granted its presence, the more strongly felt is its absence. There seems to be a general tendency to prefer the pills packed in a familiar way, even if the di different project, product sorry, might have precisely the same chemical content. The same goes for cosmetics, as well as for herbal medicine that is acquired through relatives or directly from the local context. <coughs> Just let me finish by noting here that the issue of trust is very important, even if I don't have to dwell on it now. Pills, cosmetics, foods are all in direct touch with the body and involve the senses in prominent ways. Their special sensitivity stems from their, from their affective qualities and those are hard to negotiate consciously. That is probably why even a trivial item such as shampoo like this that is easily available, available both here and there, is often stubbornly carried across borders. <laughs> Transporting a particular brand of coffee or tea is also very common. And food parcels containing <coughs> myriads of industrial and homemade edibles are probably the most mobile objects of transnational dwelling that at the same time enable a particular kind of culturally imbued 
sociality. As for the food, the fact that it's perishable as it's consumed does not contradict my argument about material layers of transnational lives. On the contrary, it can be seen as the utmost proof of the ways of being unhindered by distance. If the migrant is able to enjoy the preferred tastes and smells without much worry about being able to acquire them soon again, it's the practice of eating specific food that ensures continuity, not the stable or the perishable materiality of a food item. I think I end here because I think I made my point and uh, I hope uh, to be able to say some more if you have questions. Thank you very much. some conclusions about the type of objects that you could see that they were more cherished or more or more open brought from one place to the other. Are they more are they intimately connected to the body? Like for example you are showing a lot of edibles or mm -hmm. uh, cosmetics and clothes, for example. Uh, and other objects less connected to the body are less mm -hmm. um, prominent, I don't know. Um, yeah, as, as I hope you, you heard, I know this is just an oral presentation and so on, but I, um, I'm trying as a, as a scholar of migration living and working in Sweden with its particular, particular history of migration research being geared towards solving the problems of integration. Okay? It's a very different context than UK or, I mean, it's, it's a very different context, okay? So, so I'm trying to do my, my little best uh, to detach my work from the ideas of bounded groups, communities. So I did on purpose research with different types of migrants and migrants from different countries in order to tease out what is it that they have in common. So one of the most interesting, and of course it's very much informed by my, myself being a migrant. It's very much informed by my interest in highly skilled migrant, the migrants that has another kind of research questions. But I see things, I mean, that are coming out clearly if you do not look at migrants as those having integration problems, if you don't look at migrants as those who want to represent their identity uh, that should be lost in the new, you know, if, if you kind of think in different ways and say, okay, what is it that these people do? You know, the Bosnian refugees 20 years later, buying houses in a country that actually is not their country, but where they used to spend summer holidays before. I mean, what, you know, this with having different homes and different houses and how this develops and uh, how they are becoming transnational in the sense of like, okay, having some aspects of their identity identifications that are very important to them, but then going on and being different. I mean, the, the, the scholarship of, yeah, diaspora uh, communities uh, can't not show that things are changing, not only in the homeland, but for people yeah, and so on. So to your question, what is the most common? Now, what was the most, maybe not surprising, but when you, when you have this kind of very diverse migrants, and you unlock your mind from thinking about groups from countries, okay? Then you see some things, and what I suggested now in the end, uh, which, which I think is very interesting also theoretically, because since a few years ago, I have been very much interested in affect and material culture. It's damn difficult, because you ask people to tell you something that can't be told, because affect, affect comes before emotion and is not yet something that you talk about. So it's, it's very challenging theoretically to, to, and also methodologically, like how to get these things. But I, I hope I'm getting there uh, somehow. And uh, I hope to, to have a book uh, done finally on, on this, based on this project. So what I noticed, what, what is most important to people is this materialities, be it food, be it medicine, that are um, um, like, yeah, the, 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 at, the, at the interface with, with body or that, that you do consume, that you rub in your, your body, that you, you know, and that is also then um, mirrored or, or the, the counterpart thing that I didn't talk about today is um, 
this feeling, being, being at home, feeling at home in a new surroundings for relatively new migrants, like when is it that you decide to have this first haircut with the new hairdresser? I mean, these are such trivial things. I, I, I know that you understand uh, what I'm talking about because we all have had our fright of changing hairdresser or of, of my uh, gynecologist getting retired in Zagreb, okay? I mean, we're talking about, it's not, yeah, dentists are a bit easier, but not, <laughs> you understand? It, no, you understand what I mean? It's, it, and, and this is also what I didn't say yet, but I'm saying this is also, as a migration scholar, I think there is a grand, grand potential to show, to the unlock our, our seeing migrants as different, because we all migrants are not understand what I'm talking about here. There is a commonality of this experience, which is not speci specific to, to migrants, but to people who live and things change around them. And also there is a strong potential of showing how internal migrants, like migrants who are not ethnically different, but just change towns, or maybe even just neighborhoods. <laughs> um, this is stretching it a bit now, but still um, with the notion of migrant. But, but internal migrants, international migrants, <laughs> have so much more in common than we are taught to believe when we, in the end of the day, come to a museum and say, you know, <laughs> the groups, and these are their characteristics. Fine, worthwhile in some context, but there is, when it comes to all the right-wing kind of <laughs> ideas that are more and more dominant in Europe and elsewhere, about how migrants are different and how their presence is disruptive or dangerous. I mean, this is very important. Again, it's a very small contribution that I think we can get. But yes, bodily, kind of close to the body on the one hand, but then again, there is this phenomenological kind of thing that I, I approach, that, I, that, that, that I'm trying to work with. It's also objects of daily use, these nice, these cheese slicers and so on, that people get used to because of having been my, I've never used a cheese slicer before moving to Sweden, I've never seen one, uh, but uh, no, I can't live without it. And so it's funny, I'm not talking about just about myself, but it's funny how there are some Swedish objects that people uh, get used to. And in a second part of my paper that will be published, it's these moments of how migrants are recognized at home for being different because they have different habits, they have different material practices. These cracks of the habits that are recognized by people who stayed behind, uh, it's extremely interesting. But yes, what they all have in common is that the most important things, and now I'm talking about this hard to notice, forgotten, so much a part of your habitus, daily used objects. I'm not talking about, a, I don't know, a pencil given to me by my late grandmother or something like that. Of course, I mean, obviously there are such meanings and emotional investments, but I'm talking about, you know, things that you have in your drawer or moments when people tell me, oh, but I have this object in my other kitchen. I thought it was here, but it's my, I mean, that's the like epitome of unproblematic transnational lives. <laughs> but still you can't negotiate distance because you are here and you don't have it in this drawer. Yeah. Is there a difference between what uh, Mr. Basu was speaking about, um, like forced migration or voluntary migration in the relationship to these objects? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, what people, I, I have been, I have been <coughs> meeting as a researcher, I have been meeting uh, people who came as refugees from Bosnia, Herzegovina in the 90s, and I met them some five years upon their arrival. Uh, most of them were in the process of obtaining citizenship. They got very quickly, they got resi uh, residence permits, but, but then citizenship five years later and so on and so forth. And um, the moment these people, uh, and now I'm generalizing of course, but that's a trend. They got citizenship, they sold their, their property in the worn torn Bosnia, post-war Bosnia, and bought summer houses in Croatia, even if some of them were expelled by the ethnic Croats in their law, but, you know, but it doesn't matter really because it's not about ethnic, ethnic framings. It's, it's, a, it's about experiences or aspects of experience or habits that people want to recreate if they can, okay? Of course, what people told me about their coming to, and I didn't 
maybe it was mentioned, you said war experiences are my interest, but I, I spent many years in Croatia as a Croatian scholar at that time, um, um, writing about civilians' experiences in war. And uh, so I come from, you know, so, so my, my knowledge on, on refugees is kind of founded in, um, in, in that kind of research. So of course, uh, if you're a refugee who had to leave abruptly, and whose everyday materialities of the kind, of the unproblematic kind that I was suggesting here, were totally disrupted and they didn't have any choice. Um, obviously, they, they couldn't care less for cheese slicers. I mean, that's, that's so obvious. But what they did miss is, of course, uh, the photo albums. And then, of course, the photo albums, we know about photo albums and emotional value and then, and, and, you know, family history represented or, if you like, materialized in a way. But then again, what was very interesting, interesting and make, makes kind of a contribution to me believing that what I do makes sense and it might be important in a bigger picture of what we know and what we want to know about the migrants is, okay, just an anecdote. Someone I've, I'm, I'm kind of following for many years who came as refugee, who told me about Actually, the most traumatic experience for her in Sweden was when she was together with hundreds of other people in some collection center, I don't know, you know, where they were first housed. And when a good willing NGO, like a volunteer or Red Cross person, was teaching them how to put on a washing machine or how to dispose of the garbage. I mean, these were middle class people, urban people from Bosnia, you know. but. They had their agenda, you know, the, in these centers. They, they showed them, you know, how to pull the water in the toilet and so on. So she says, then later, when due to very happy circumstances, some cousin was bringing one of the family albums. So this same woman could show this. They couldn't speak, uh, she didn't speak English, she couldn't speak Swedish by then. But she was then showing this person the album. And actually, it was this kind of things that she was showing. It was this only represented on the photo because it all burnt down and didn't exist anymore. But it was this kind of daily normality of her home that was furnished in a certain way that she was showing to this person who unwillingly and unwittingly was insulting her or kind of making it clear to her that she's just a refugee, like a, you know, a category without, without any right to be to be uh, representing her true experience of or who she is in these material terms. So she said that he apologized to her, uh, which I think is kind of directly connected to. to but of course, um, um, again, time and change over time is so important to take into consideration. And by then refugees of 20 or 25 years ago, uh, some of them I have also in this particular paper, I have some examples of people who returned, who were young youngsters or children when they came to Sweden, they got their education, went back to Bosnia to well-paid jobs with international organizations, whatever, found their respective husbands there and so on. So what they, they, tell, what they can't live uh, without is the Thai spices that they buy in Sweden when they visit Sweden and bring to Bosnia and they're like the only household in whole Sarajevo, well, that, or um, in their uh, surroundings that, that eats that food and cooks that food. Because they got, you know, so again, unlocking from this like Thai food, Bosnians, oh my God, no, 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 we can't represent that in the museum. Yeah, we should. And talking about all these connections and uh, I think you had all this, uh, I mean, kind of fitting in, in my very, uh, yeah, this, this sensitizing people for the importance of what is seen as banal, <laughs> you know, adding that map on the maps of human migrations, and so, you know, so, so having, having that kind of perspective through these material objects that I hope most people here, migrants or not, can understand what's the point and can understand this, um, it's emotional, but it's not representation of belonging. It's important, but it's not that you're dying if you don't have it, of course. Uh, if you have the choice, you are a lucky guy. <laughs> if you have these two kitchens that are yours, right? It's a wonderful uh, aspect of my research to, to have adult people who are migrants established and then be becoming children when they go <coughs> home 
to their parents' household. I mean, there are many strengths that are interesting. But of course, I'm not lumping together different migrant experiences, but I'm just saying that refugees after 5, 10, 15, 20 years are not the refugees from day one, obviously. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, that, was, that, that was great, very, very important um, mm -hmm. uh, contribution to, uh, to uh, as a corrective, uh, as you say, to the kinds of things that find themselves into museums typically. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. we do have museums with these kinds of things to make some of the points that you're making. Mm -hmm. I think there's two, two things I, I just wanted to um, bring out. One was indeed this issue of temporality. Um, having worked a lot with m migrants, but also the issue of the rupture of time uh, in another way, mm -hmm. 100 years on, mm -hmm. 150 years on, mm -hmm. where people have become assimilated, mm -hmm. have become just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And another politics or another need uh, to distinguish, to recover difference. So in my work, for instance, with a, 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 a new a newly discovered sense of otherness is about needing to construct that, mm -hmm. which is when the iconic comes into play. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's not the personal, mm -hmm. it's something then that's exterior out, that yeah. one's trying to make mm -hmm. interior. And, it, and the important thing in terms of what you're saying is I think that also can have an affective, phenomenological kind, of, um, yes. kind of thing. So I, I think my point would be about, um, I find that the, the, the most interesting thing that you've observed, and I, you know, I see it every day, my wife too, uh, is indeed um, why the very, very same product mm. you could buy Next door, practically, next door, in London, but definitely. But has this other there. Yes, yes, and so, yeah. and I think you're right to, to mm. kind of that's, there's something that needs thinking through mm. there. Mm. And you're making these dis uh, distinction <coughs> between, as it were, the symbolic or the sign, mm. uh, and you've suggested that's addressed outwardly. Mm. And that's my question, really, because these can also be addressed inward inwardly, consumed, you know, it's connecting some of what you talk about to the work of, say, Danny Miller. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. And, um, and this, so this being and belonging, that mm. who's the performance for? Mm. And it is all about, yes, aff affect and the ineffable in that mm. sense, which, mm. which absolutely is why anthropology, I guess, has the tools to be able to approach these mm. kinds of things. But I think that distinction is the thing that needs, you know, it, that's what I think the in-betweenness tries to do, mm -hmm. is, to, is to say that um, this isn't an either-or, uh, this is not either a sign uh, that's self-consciously yes. expressed outwardly, or a being unself-conscious, mm. the habitus, mm. Mm. but actually it's a much more blurred thing, um, so that the fact that that is the very same product, but one mm. happened to be you know, purchased or sent mm. from mm. Bosnia, the other mm. from, uh, from down the road, mm. um, makes all the difference because it contains, it carries something else. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, I, I, re I need to work more on this and to think, think more about this, because I think it's really, it, it, it will be really important to try to, to answer this question. Why exactly? I mean, I have been asking people, I have my ideas, but I, I can't develop them there. But just, I mean, I have many more slides, but just this here, this is actually from Croatia. And I was asked, I was asked, these are my stairs at my home, but the things have been sent by someone from Zagreb to their grandchild that they met like once a year, three year old or something. Yeah. Handmade pullover and uh, some candy, as you can see, and some, some booklet or whatever it is. Um, and this candy that you see, everyone coming not only from Croatia, but from former Yugoslavia would see this as a Croatian product, so definitely, you're right, I mean, there is sy symbol and signal of some kind of belonging, some kind of embeddedness that is totally a personal, uh, regardless to if I, I, I had la last time I was trying Kiki, it w I was eight years old, I don't like them, but it's dear to me, you know, to see this, yeah, you understand, so, so um, absolutely, it's not either or, and it's, as we know as anthropologists, ethnologists, people who are into this kind of cultural fields, that uh, th these are analytical distinctions. I mean, people <laughs> can be proud of something and want to display it in some kind of, again, we're talking about everyday situations, display it as something that is theirs and pertaining to their cultural background. 
uh, even if they, like half an hour ago, just didn't think about it in these terms. But um, this is an analytical distinction that I'm making. And again, I remind you that I come from the Swedish migration scholarship field uh, and as such feel responsible to say, please combine, uh, expand, have also this perspective. Do not only lock your mind into symbols of identities, which then bring along uh, yeah, this kind of groupism kind of, uh, approach uh, that doesn't bring us anywhere. It brings us to a very bad place politically. Uh, so yeah, I totally agree and I would be happy to, to be in touch on these matters because the, uh, sometimes the, the historical examples and the changes of the objects and uh, the, 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 the placing of the objects, of course, can tell us, tell us more. And uh, I, I want to, to urge you to go to the House of European Cultures in Brussels. Those of you who haven't been there, it's relatively new. Um, it's a historical kind of museum. If Yeah, it is a museum. I think it's very cleverly done. And then talking about, it wasn't this particular candy, but there was something from my childhood, from my country of origin that was put there just as, you know, not there is no <coughs> systematic representation, but some everyday objects, you know, in like pre-social, post-socialist or whatever context. And uh, my emotional reaction to, to, s to that uh, was very strong. Uh, and there it was like a symbol of, of some time and some context. So it's analytical distinctions. 